Trying to bring you down, but for real, you might as well give up now. Think you got a chance, but I don't see how. Got a real tight grip when I hold that crown. My life been good and bad and all around. The more things I lost, the more I found. One thing I taught myself to do, no matter the problem, refuse to lose. So, how you want it, man? You can choose. If you can't take the heat, don't light the fuse. See, I walk in slow and ignite the room. Like fire, everything I touch, I consume. I'm getting up while y'all just snooze. While you make breakfast, man, I'm on the move. I'm the first one in and the last one out. Whoever Owns the place, gotta drag me out ah. In me I trust, yeah I smell like success This Elon Musk, huh? Everybody wanna be like us We don't stop cause the top just ain't enough, huh? I ain't never gay, no I ain't scamming You know black men don't blush, huh? Came here ready to fight on this night You better just run for your life Won't you come and see what it's like Living by the rules that you write You ain't all those lavish delights Now you had no back in sight All the little lies you recite Just makes all the savage unite Usually I'm very polite But I'ma get savage tonight Even when a dog being nice Every single dog gonna bite You might think I'm wrong but I'm right Just let it get a strong appetite I'ma let it breathe just a little Give it to you strong heavy metal I don't make a sound when I strike You better just run for your life All right, all right. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Ward Radio live stream. I am your host, Cardinalis. Today, I'm joined in the studio by a super killer cast. We have got Josh Gailey, our, uh, oh man, I should have looked this up before you started, our Bicket Tonight brother from another mother, our B3, you know what I'm saying, <laughs> uh, B to the third, Josh Gailey, also author of, dang it, I forgot to get your book, but I got a copy here somewhere. I got one. I got one. Oh, you got it? Okay, throw it, throw it up, my man. Throw it up. Here we go. Witnessing Miracles, Historical Evidence for the Resurrection and Book of Mormon by Josh Gailey. Rock on. He's here as well as we're joined by Jerry Grover. What's going on, Jerry? How you doing, man? Good. Can, can you smile? Like, like whenever I introduce I, I, you. you I, know? I, I'm just here for color commentary, so I'm trying to be as happy as I can be. Okay, cool. I also have to. I, I promote one book. Jerry has about 10 books, all of them really easy reading. So. Yeah, for real. So um, anyway, glad to see you here, my man. Glad to see you here, Jerry. And um, yeah, we're going to, yeah, we'll get you, we'll get you, like, get that mic close to your face, baby. Get that mic close to your face. There we go. You know, you're single and you're ready to mingle now, all right? These ladies got to see you looking all, you know, all uh, professional-like. Um, and we're also uh, guarded by none other than our boy, Ed Thomas. Unfortunately, our studio camera is down. Look at that. It's all blank, man. Can't see him. But Ed Thomas is here and he usually gives his signature uh hello making sure you keep everybody safe here in the studio anyway um let's not forget via zoom we're also joined by brad whitbeck what's going on brad how you doing man hey doing great getting better all right <laughs> sick good to hear well you look good you don't look see that's see that's what's so cool about being an attractive actor you always look good you know, and that's all that really does matter. Okay, yeah, that's all that matters, right? right. Yes. Uh, primary lesson number seven. 
uh, <laughs> looks are all that matter, right? You know. So yeah. anyway, um, perfectionism at its finest. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Sweet. I dig. I dig. Oops. Actually, I turned on Josh instead of turning on you. Okay. There we go. Anyway, hey, we got a even super- even more perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got a super cool uh, subject that we're going to be covering today. Uh, in celebration of March Madness, Josh Gailey here, who is our kind of our resident expert on all things archaeological. Jonah Barnes is the associate professor of all things apocryphal. Uh, Josh Gailey is the, I don't want to call you the associate professor, that's already used, the alchemist of all things archaeological. <laughs> but alchemy, that's such a soft science. Um, we would ha- what's, a, what's another A word for an alliteration for you? Uh, there's a lot of A words. I'm not sure we want to use them. Okay, but. the apostle of all things archaeological, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, uh, has made a really sweet bracket for us here of the Book of Mormon Evidence Sweet 16 in celebration of March Madness, we're actually going to be choosing um, of the 16 top evidences of the Book of Mormon of all Ooh. of yeah, of all these evidences. Uh, you can check this out in our Discord as well, Brad, if you just want to pull up the little icon there. I just shoved it yeah. in the Discord. Um, if you uh, uh, actually know, I have to shove it the discord so you can see it. But anyway, you guys have to check out and please let us know as you are liking the stream, as you guys are entering the chat, as you guys are coming on in, please let us know of this sweet 16, which one you guys would like to talk about. So anyway, I have talked way too much before we get further into this and we start reading super chats and all that stuff. Josh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Jerry, tell us a little bit about yourself for those uh, people in our audience that haven't had a chance to meet you guys and know who you are and why you're so cool. Just give us the brief little, you know, one and a half minute intro, the 90 second intro here and tell us why you're so cool. And um, I don't know, something about yourself, your favorite food, I guess. And uh, yeah, we'll just go from there. Josh, go. Boom. My name's Josh Gailey, everybody. It's great to be back on the show. I'm an evangelist from the Church of Jesus Christ. We're one of the Restoration Cousins to the Latter-day Saints. Our headquarters is out in Pennsylvania, and I'm part of the leadership of, of that church and that organization. We're a church that loves the Book of Mormon, has a zeal and a passion for its truth and historicity. It's scripture to us, and we're passionate about the Book of Mormon. And tonight... I, I do have an undergraduate degree in archaeological science, and so that, that's part of why I love tying into the history and looking at the Book of Mormon in a little bit greater depth. I'm not sure my depth even comes close to our partner across the studio, so I'll pass the baton over to Jerry. All right, Jerry, my man. Well, as color commentator, I thought it was he would be the archangel of archaeology. Does that, does that work? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's Double pretty cool. Yeah. By the way, you're the least color turn, guy. Turn no, the lights up. The Make me glow. You're the Make whitest dude in this room. Yeah, I can do it. Fair like, oh, wait, and delightsome. I've got uh, – wait, hold oh, on. I've got a – does it – no. Oh, no, 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 no. Hold on. If I go on to Josh. Oh. <laughs> Like those special effects you get in the Book of Mormon movies, you know what I'm this saying? This chair's about to break. I got, I got <laughs> you. Got to watch out! Don't laugh too hard, yeah. man. You know. So Jerry, give us your uh, introduction, and then people know Brad, so he'll get like ten seconds instead of like ninety yeah. seconds. But tell us about yourself, bro. What's your deal? Uh, well, I've done a bunch of books on Book of Mormon, various topics in Book of Mormon, uh, mostly scientific and linguistic. That's kind of what. I specialize in and sponsor research also of, of others in those lines. Uh, I'm a licensed professional geologist, licensed professional structural civil engineer um, by trade. Um, don't have too much else to say. I, favorite food, probably chitlins. I guess. Can, can I say something for Jerry? I, mean, <laughs> what? I, I believe Jerry is one of the leading researchers that's alive that studies i was gonna say you suck at promoting yourself bro you know (laughs) oh i'm so i'm worse than the dead ones is that what you're saying i'm the worst (laughs) of the dead ones is that what you're telling me (laughs) so brad hit it bmslr.org for jerry's stuff (laughs) yeah rock on man all right brad hit us dude talk about yourself for a second and about jerry because you're the one that got him on our program bro heck yeah man dude uh so me in brief I am a Canadian writer, actor, and comedian. Uh, mostly write stuff in like the realm of. I started with screenplays. I've moved into uh, online fantasy writing, online like literal physical books, <laughs> um, and on Kindle and everything there too. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, co-write with my wife, 
Um, and I'm just a big nerd about the church and about the scriptures. And that's what got me running into Jerry Grover in the first place. I, I ended up finding one of his books online on bmslr.org and um, came across his translation of the characters document and thought it was super interesting. And then kept looking and I'm like, oh my gosh, he has stuff about like the Jaredites and Shul and the swords that he made. And he has stuff about, oh, the entire timeline of the Book of Mormon. Now I don't have to wonder why Jacob was so freaking old when he had his kids, right? Like all of these questions and things that I was like, huh, are there any good answers to him? It's like, Jerry has a good answer for like most of the things. <laughs> So um, it's really awesome. I, I think he's done some really good work. I'm psyched that we're getting him on the show. It's good. All right. Sick, man. Sick. So anyway, um, I'm going <clears> to <throat> jump right in here. I'm going to jump right in here uh, to this. Do What do you say we do the bracket right now? Josh, you want to yeah, do the bracket, sure. my man, and All just right. uh, see what's going on? So, okay, why don't you just lead us through this bracket and tell us uh, exactly what we're seeing right here. And what we're going to talk about and why you think all of these different things are indeed the sickest and best um, evidences of the Book of Mormon. And then, uh, oh gosh, and then I got a I got a Heartlander question for you guys too. Oh, geez, man, Ooh. there's so much to talk about all at one time. <laughs> Do this one first and then I'm going to ask you some questions later because I got to tell you, I got to tell you. <sighs> That's one of the the missionaries of the Heartland Gospel have stolen my heart on two subjects. And you know what I'm saying? I got to ask. I got to ask you some questions. It's like, you know, when you're a missionary Ooh. and like the evangelical friend has like seeded doubt about the Book of Mormon there. You know what I'm saying? Now the friend's coming to you and asking <laughs> questions. It's kind of like that, bro. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, start out with these awesome Book of Mormon evidences that we have right here. Boom, shakalaka. Josh Gailey, go. Okay. So we have broken down our sweet 16 bracket into four categories. By no means have we like picked the top 16 we've just picked out 16 that fit into certain categories yeah because there's so many evidences for the book of mormon there's lots of reasons to believe it to know it's true obviously you know one that we excluded from the list is personal testimony we all agree that the witness of the spirit is the number one evidence that any human being could possibly get when they take the challenge from moroni chapter 10 and apply it oh, in yeah. prayer and seek the lord that's not on this list because it would win Okay, and we want yeah. this to be something that, that has a fair fighting chance. So we have four categories in our top 16. Uh, I'll be, uh, I guess I'll be Vanna White for a little moment. We have names and archaeology. Yeah. So we're going to focus on names in the Book of Mormon a little bit with that. Look at some archaeological discoveries. Look at some etymology stuff, which is just meaning of words. We'll take a peek at some of those things. Next up is an examination of the plates. Because I made the bracket, I get to pick stuff from my book. I think that's, uh, yeah. <laughs> if somebody else wants to make the bracket on Adobe, you get to do it. But until that day comes, all right, the bracket's going to include some Josh Gailey stuff because I, I pulled it out. So we're going to look at the eyewitnesses, some of the evidence from the original manuscripts, and we're all doing high-level stuff. We're not getting in the weeds tonight. We're just having fun. And so we're going to look at the evidence for the empty stone box, cross compare that with the tomb of Christ, and we're going to look at enemies to the movement and how even enemies, when they spoke about things tied to the plates, how they actually provide an evidence of the plates, even though they didn't necessarily believe in them. Then on, so that's the, the plates bracket. We're going to have the, the linguistic bracket, which is going to be chiasmus, Hebraisms, uh, Reformed Egyptian, and some of Brian Stubbs' work on Utah Ashtaken. And then in the last bracket, the geology bracket, we're going to let Jerry Grover Wait, run. Wait, what did you just say? U Usht? Like, I've heard it called Udo Aztecan. Is that the heavily Americanized suburban version? And you're that cool guy that says Genghis Khan in front of Congress <laughs> just to sound super smart instead of saying Genghis Khan. I'm just in it for the points, bro. However <laughs> I can. <laughs> so... Uh, the geology bracket, we're going to look at some of Jerry's work on the destruction that happened in 3rd Nephi. There's also some geological events in the Book of Mormon tied down south to the land of Nephi when there's, uh, if you remember, I think Nephi and Lehi are imprisoned and there's some seismic activity. And also we have Tumbaga and Bountiful, Old World Bountiful. So we're going to take a look at those 16 tonight. And if anybody wants to include their vote, because we're all going to vote on here and everybody's vote counts, but you have to have a super chat when we're going through the brackets 
to be able to make your selection on which one moves on in any given category. Oh, so. wow. You're pumping the Super Chats for me, bro. Oh, Thank absolutely. you very much. Thank you very much, man. So um, I've never done an on-air bracket. Should I just say, I guess we have to start out on the top left between name archaeologies, and then everybody just has to choose between Nahum, Jershon, Soraya, and Mulek. Although part of me is tempted to say, on the show we've already talked about the maps of Nahum, I'm not familiar with the arguments about Jershon. Soraya is the name where they used to think that it wasn't a real name, and then they found people named Soraya, yep. right? And so, then, Carden, yes, Brad. We, what we should probably do is lead off with Nahum versus Jershon. Yep. Right? And then give our reasons for that. Yep. Ah, and then, yeah. Sorry, I'm and the idiot. And then once we establish the winner there, we do Soraya v. Mulek. So I can dunk, I can there. dunk, but I can't do a March Madness bracket right. <laughs> yeah, okay, cool. Awesome, yeah. Welcome and I'm to Ward Radio. We're good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're good. Okay. I'm just over here enjoying the fact that our little local school of Duquesne happened to pull out a nice little victory yesterday, and that has inspired this whole entire podcast. All right. Well, yeah. Okay. Awesome. They played yesterday, I take it, huh? Yeah, they played BYU, and uh, I hate to break oh, it to you. Oh, yeah. yeah. That, wasn't that like, kind of like a big upset? A little bit, a little bit. Uh, not unexpected by everybody, right, Jerry? Yeah. Okay. I've been a BYU fan for 50 years, so they kind of choke oftentimes. <laughs> <laughs> they kind of choke oftentimes. <laughs> Ah, that's the yeah, academic yeah, yeah, version yeah, where they just, blew it. <laughs> yeah, I was like to say that, that. I don't know how many how those adjectives and adverbs all end up to not be in a diss, but that's funny. Yeah. Well, I used to be a politician, so I have to speak and double speak. Okay, cool. I hear you. <laughs> nice. Bro. I hear you. I hear you, bro. Okay, so Brad, lead us off, bro. Uh, Nehom versus Jershon. So, how do we vote on this? Right. Does the audience vote? Do we vote? What do we do? Everybody votes. Everybody votes. Everybody votes. Okay, so you have to tell us. Uh, okay. Which which argument you think is better, right, Josh? And then the yeah, Brad, are you votes? comfortable laying out both or or? Uh, I am comfortable with Nahum. I want to hear someone else give Ber Jershon. Okay, fire away. Okay, so I would say Nahum is a pretty awesome, awesome evidence of the Book of Mormon because you have Lehi going down through near the Red Sea and the borders of the Red Sea, going down and then across east after a place called. Um, sorry, he goes and then right before they go east is at Nahum, right? And this is where Ishmael dies. This is where um, the family has kind of headed more inland, it seems, from the scriptures. And what we have found is now there has been an altar found that has Nahum inscribed on it as like one of the principalities in the area, one of the uh, ruling areas that was out there and so this is a place that would have existed at the time that they were there and it wasn't something that would have been commonly known on any maps that we know that joseph smith would have had access to and so it's a pretty bullseye evidence that just out of nowhere uh joseph smith while translating the book of mormon happens to say um that there's this place that they buried a guy who died in a place called Nahum, which also happens to be a Hebrew play on words meaning, uh, referencing mourning, like M O U R N, mourning. Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, and so there's, bonus there's points. three different altars at the Bahrain Temple. So there's three different altars. They date to the right time. They're in the exact location because they're traveling south, southeast along the Arabian Peninsula. So it's, it's both a, a dating, an exact place, and the Semitic consonants are all matching so it is an it on a couple different levels it's a bullseye and to brad's point when they head east from nahum you reach the only place that could possibly be described as bountiful on the entire arabian peninsula so it's and if joseph smith was using maps from his time or descriptions from his time they would not have found a place or identified a place that was anything like that okay so speaking of names right now before we move on to jershon fidget the crazy in the chat has a really interesting question says all righty then in a discord call yesterday someone remarked that tiankum sounds like a very mesoamerican name what's their opinion on that jerry you're the meso guy and the language guy writing a whole entire book on the translation of the characters document what do you say man does tiankum that just sound mesoamerican to you or does it just sound mezzo uh, or just American? You know, what's it sound, bro? Is that in your, your Sumerian? Yeah. Well, I don't, um, 
there really aren't any names, hardly any, that really have any correlation to what you call either Native American or Mesoamerican um, languages, which the question is, so why would that happen, right? Especially like Lamanite names or something? Sure, okay. But what, what seems to be happening is that, that all the names are given either in Hebrew, Egyptian, um, or I have kind of constructed Sumerian is what I call it. So they're actually translating the meanings of the names. They're not transliterating. They're not actually just taking a name from a Mesoamerican language and putting it in the Book of Mormon. They're taking the meaning of it and putting it in. Oh, interesting. So you wouldn't really expect, that's why we don't really see any anything that would indicate so, a different language. So if some guy's name was Joel Schumacher, for example, which might be the German term for shoemaker, I'd assume, right? Then when you translate that into Spanish, he'd be calling him the, I don't know what the word Ferrar- for a Ferrari. is. Ferrari. <laughs> oh, yeah, Ferrari. Oh, yeah. It was a guy that drove the Ferrari. Rock on. So, um, yeah, they, they would just take the meaning of the name and then put yeah. it in their own language. It's called a calc is what they call it. So, Oh, interesting. Yeah, okay. Tiancom, I, you know, I don't have my book in front of me, but I actually think that when you constructed that, if you use the Sumerian, it means something to the effect of um, powerful javelin. Um, uh, oh, that war, fits. War, really? Yeah. Really? Yeah, something like that. I, I'd have to look it up. It means stabber of the heart of evil Lamanites, basically. That's <laughs> yeah, great. Well, yeah, it's, not, it's something it's, like that. Yeah. yeah. So it actually kind of matches a little bit of what he did. So. But, Jerry, that's what you found in a lot of the names, right, with your Sumerian work when you were looking at the etymologies was that oftentimes what they were doing, what the authors were really doing was the roots were showcasing, if, like, they were describing the people and what they were doing, and that's what the meaning of the names actually meant when you were di- diving into the text a little bit. Not unlike like what you would find in maybe like Genesis in yeah. a lot of cases. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and some of them were like they had it in Hebrew, so it was a Hebrew name. It actually sometimes can mean something in Egyptian, um, and then also in this constructed Sumerian. So sometimes the names, they're actually, I think, constructing the glyph forms in yeah. a very comp- complex way, so they have multiple meanings which we don't see. That's awesome. But well, okay, and so I got a question for you guys. Josh, you graduated in archaeology. Jerry, you've researched endlessly, and Brad, you're just smart and Canadian, and their educational system is second to none in the world. Um, so all but, my education's American, but we'll pretend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So, Five points off. Yeah, for real. <laughs> yeah. So I got a question for you guys. Like, yeah, the maps of Nehom are more evidence for Lehi's travel through the Saudi Peninsula and the existence of that tribal journey and that land as dictated in the Book of Mormon in a way that Joseph Smith could not known, have known. All the time we hear the enemies of the Book of Mormon and the cynics and the hateful, you know, screeching harpy, uh, cat lady blue haired day drinkers. You know what I'm saying? Saying like, oh, the Book of Mormon can't be decided. That, that was very descriptive. You know, as you can tell, I, I've, I've got some trauma I'm bringing to this, right? But anyway, I just like totally so, tuned it out. Just, like, just tuned it out. What a cat lady. Come so, so anyway, I just, you know, like, I did, like ah, can't be the Book of Mormon. It's real. It's fake okay. science. It's getting better. So, it's um, getting better. Yeah, it's getting better. So anyway, okay, so the people that hate the Book of Mormon, they're always trying to be snotty and trying to scoff it and dismiss it, are always throwing away this big word. They're throwing around this big word, you know, oh, it's anachronistic, right? And oh, no, anachronisms in the Book of Mormon, right? And they and the classic example that I've heard a lot of times is, you know, oh, if I'm reading a book and it says Abraham Lincoln picked up his iPhone, then I know the book couldn't have been written in the 1840s because uh, iPhones are anachronistic to Abraham Lincoln or whatever their example that they make is, right? And they act like they can like, oh, just disprove the Book of Mormon because there's anachronisms of words they just didn't understand instead of words that were truly anachronistic. Is there a reverse anachronism? Like, can't there be things... So not disqualifying, we know that it can't be true, but can't there be things so qualifying that you know it can't be a lie? Does that make sense? Is there like a reverse, is there a criteria for reverse anachronisms? Do you get what I'm saying? Where it's just like, at some point you have to say, this one piece of evidence is like so strong, and it's not even just one, there's multiple uh, uh, um, uh, multiple, uh, what would you call them? Uh, 
Cor- altars. Correspondences or whatever. that. Yeah, yeah. multiple, co- like just all of the archaeology that we have discovered about the maps of Nahum perfectly corresponding with the inspired rate in the Book of Mormon in a way that Joseph Smith could not have known on so many levels. Isn't that just a reverse, a, a reverse anachronism? Anybody? Brad's, Brad's well, I, I just asked ChatGPT, and it tells me that the opposite of an anachronism is a prochronism. Okay. I'm sure it didn't make that up on the spot, so sounds like we should use that. Okay, wait, wait. What did you, what did you call it? A prochronism? A prochronism, and it's a word that's been around forever. And sounds if like anyone prehistoric man. Sounds like a prehistoric man. Like a prehistoric man. <laughs> okay, I am I am pulling this up right now. But a prochronism literally mm-hmm. is an anachronism marked by the assignment of something as an event to date earlier than the actual historical one. Wait, wait, no. No, that's a before. Yeah, that's kind of. Oh, no, that's a prochronism. Ah, Chat GPT was wrong. Chat GPT was, no, was close. No, no, no. It's never been wrong, Tartan. <laughs> and I'm going to gaslight anyone who disagrees with this definition given to me by a robot right now. <laughs> so all science is inference in when it comes to historical stuff. You know, archaeologists and historians are inferring based on data. They're drawing conclusions based on data that's in front of them, and they're making an inference. They're arguing that their inference is going to be the best case scenario. When it comes to biblical archaeology, I think people would be shocked at how little information. Sometimes it's as simple as the Bible says that this site was east of here. There's a site that's east of here, so we're going to call it this name. That's the biblical name even though there's no archaeological evidence to support that. So when it comes to biblical archaeology, the threshold can be all over the map, so to speak. But when you're talking about Nahum, Nahum crosses the threshold to Cardin, the closest of what you could approximate anything that you're describing. So, you know, when it comes to Nahum, three different altars, multiple maps, a prediction of a gentleman that dies, and we have actually, Neil Rapley has found a stone of a funerary stela that has the name and it's not a common name for the time period and you have the exact place at the right time and every piece fits we're not going to find any more information in the old world that's going to improve the archaeological information that's already been discovered from nahum on a biblical standard if that was a biblical site it would be on every map in your bible that you would have okay so it's it's a st- so it just depends on where we're placing the threshold. Well, so here's my question though. Like you're probably uh, of all three of us, at least at this table. All right, you're, you you've got some of the higher credentials. You graduated from the most prestigious archaeological college in North America, Penn State's archaeology program. We are baby. Yeah, exactly. It's 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 very well known as kind of like the Harvard of archaeology. UCLA right? is about ready to pick a fight with you, but I'm gonna land with you. Yeah, you're gonna land with me. Okay, all right. So, um, I actually, I take that back. UCLA is better because they're closer. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. But anyway, um, the uh, I was gonna say that. Okay, all the time, there's we have this uphill battle that we're fighting as people who want to inquire into the historicity of the Book of Mormon, right? And we're all ethical people here. We don't want to make, a, 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 you know, a claims that can't be supported by, you know, observable and repeatable uh, evidences consistent with the scientific method. You know what I'm saying? We don't want to do anything unethical. But all the time, I will talk with people that will see amazing evidences. They'll show me something amazing archaeologically that um, fits within the time period and with the narrative of the Book of Mormon that is an evidence of the Book of Mormon. But in hushed whispers, they don't dare come on my show and say, hey, this is actually a possibility. I'm not really making any specific claims here, but you know, this evidence, this artifact, this, this event that we've discovered, this timeline that we've been able to verify, this artifact that I'm, I'm holding in my hand right here that has been carbon dated to the exact time the Book of Mormon says this thing happened. You know, They won't talk about it in hushed whispers because they're so worried about their careers and what the archaeological community might think. And I'm looking at this, I'm thinking this should be a home run for the archaeological community. Like, how is this map of Nahum and all the evidence surrounding it, not more solid evidence of Lehi and his uh, journey out of Jerusalem and toward the new world. I'm not even saying he made it or any of that stuff, but how is that not a greater evidence than half of these cities people say Alexander the Great made it to where we have no evidence he did other than, oh, 
Well, there was a change in architecture towards a more Hellenistic column, you know what I'm saying, in in some of the municipal buildings. And Alexander in a journal claimed to have made it there once, or like one of his generals claimed to have made it there once, uh, 80 years later. So we just kind of believe what that general said as settled science. It's like how, if if if, if the maps of Nahum don't reach that threshold for the archaeological community, like what does and why is that not just as settled science now as the map of where Alexander the Great made it to? I lay this at your feet, Josh. You are responsible. <laughs> That's you're you are responsible. For, for me, it has crossed, cr- crossed the threshold. It's it's beyond so many archaeological sites in the biblical text. So for me, it it has crossed the threshold. I, I think if somebody that that wants to weigh that out, I would recommend somebody read like uh, Has Archaeology Buried the Bible by like William Deaver or something like that to get an actual background on biblical archaeology and, and the the a- information that's out there for sites on biblical archaeology. And then, and that's a basic book. That's not like a detailed, you know, boots on the ground, in, into the dirt type of a book. So, and, and then go from there. And, and when you run those comparisons, you'll start to see the strength of arguments that I think Nahum makes overall for the Book of Mormon. But Jerry, you you, you jump in too. Okay, hit it. Oh, well, as far as direct hit, I mean, in my research, I have some direct hits, yeah. you know, which, I mean, um, take it for what they're worth. But, you know, now I can match Aaron, the the general, Lamanite general that was battling Mormon. Um, we've identified him in Mesoamerica. His name in, in the Maya glyphs is born of fire. Aaron, uh-huh. Aaron means conceived in flame in Hebrew. Matches the exact Wait, time really? Frame. Yeah. yeah. Dude, that's awesome. Yeah, it's in one of my books. We're, no, we're going to talk re- about some reads. Of that stuff. We're going to be putting out some stuff this It's actually this my week. last book, so... Yeah. yeah. Uh, I haven't gotten to that one yet. Yeah, and so it, it, it actually it, it shows that he knocked off Tikal and the other... Uh, and, he, and he was backed by Teotihuacan, which matches with the Gedeontans, basically knocked them all off basically the year before the final battle. So, And that's why Mormon didn't even know there were that many people coming in, you know, and... And so, oh, wow. yeah, so there, there's correlations there. Um, you know, the character's document, take that for what it's worth, but it has, you know, Maya calendrical markers in it that actually, you know, match exactly in the Maya <laughs> infixes in the glyphs. Um, I've also got, you know, the, the actual, there's number patterns in the year counts that are the same as the Maya divinatory codexes um, using the sacred numbers. That's what Fourth Nephi is actually doing. Honestly, you can see all of the intervals because they used to track intervals in their divinatory codexes. So, you know, things like that, I guess, kind of on the level of chiasmus, you know, on the Hebrew side. And then, you know, in Mesoamerica, actually, the models we have, they actually match in terms of, you know, geography, um, archaeological locations. Now, we don't know the names and neither do the archaeologists of those. And yeah, and, and that's part of the challenge, right, that that jerry's identifying is in the new world we don't know any single name of any archaeological site that dates to the pre-classic time period okay those, except maybe lamanai yeah so well even that's even yeah. that's a modern there's like know, i think they've identified like 12 emblem place emblem glyphs in that's down in the yucatan yeah. which that isn't even that's really outside w- the yeah where the model takes place yeah. so so <laughs> I, I i'm just saying there is a lot of evidence if you will it's not um like an anachronism, they just, you know, that's like an easy, okay, that doesn't match. But you have to look at, when you're really looking at archaeology, it's a complex, you have to have all these complex correlations, right, in any archaeology. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. And biblical, they did, you know, they thought a city was here, or actually wasn't, you know. <laughs> right. And the, way, and the way they described, <clears throat> you know, the exodus and everything, it's like, oh, they went in and actually there's just, a, the Canaanites are still there. Afterwards, so the archaeology you have to take it, you have to look at the record, what it's saying, and who wrote it, and it's not going to always match the archaeology exactly. Um, 100% true. Okay, Brad, hit it. I, I said got a it. baby coughing in the background. Oh, but, I couldn't um, hear the it. Thing that, <laughs> yeah, so if, it, if it comes through, I'm sorry. But um, the thing I want to say is what's cool is you have Nahum, which was a possible anachronism that turned out to be something that was not just historically accurate, but chronologically correct. Now, we're yes. comparing that versus Shershan. And so I want to hear from you guys, 
Why do you think it's a better evidence? Why is it better than Nahum? Well, I don't. I don't think it's better. <laughs> it's just on the board. We got to vote. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. But, no. I mean. Give, yeah. Give the so best so I'll give the pro, Jershon. Right? Uh, the roots of the <laughs> on at the end is place of. You know, and you see that like there's a lot of names uh -huh. across the biblical text, and even like Sidon. Okay, even in the river, you know that has those some of those roots. But Jershon, the on is is place of, and the beginning part of the word when you break it down in the early Hebrew is going to be inheritance. And so in the Book of Mormon narrative, the Nephites are granting a group of new converts a place of inheritance. And when they do that, they name the place of the land Jershon. So it fits based on the, the Hebrew. It's actually a Hebraism, but it, it fits. The, the description in the text is matching the meaning of the name that they grant the people that they give it unto. So it's a it's a Who one figured that out. Uh, well, that's in the onomasticon for the Book of Mormon, so that's been out for a little while. Some of the, the linguists that have done some of those studies, uh, there's one professor at the University of BYU-Hawaii that's done a lot of that, but I, I forget who, who did that exact tie. Oh, wow. That's actually pretty cool. Yeah, it's very cool. Not as cool as finding the steely or finding the altars. Yeah. You know, I'll be honest with you. This is probably an easy uh, vote. Yeah, Hebraisms aren't as cool as like Indiana Jones, give me the idol, I'll toss you the whip. You know what I'm saying? Like that's not as cool as like we must defend the altar. You know, that's that's like the, the tangible nature of Nehom. Yeah. I think that's a little bit cooler. But Jershon's pretty good. Okay, so I don't know. So I think it's a, it's a six they're a sixteenth seed. Yeah, I was about yeah, gonna exactly. say they're going up against the one. Yeah, they're I was going about up against gonna the say, one seed. Yeah. I think my vote's for Nahum. Yeah, I was going to say my vote's for Nahum, too. Of course. Okay. Of course. So then really quick, let's just bur let's burn through the rest of these. You know, I mean, there's no rush, but we some of these I have a feeling are going to be one-sentence explanations. They won't take 30 minutes like Nahum did, right? So what's the next one? What's the next bracket we should do? Should we keep doing on names and archaeology? Should we go to language, geology? What should we do? Brad, you choose, bro. Oh, I think Josh. Would we finish off everything with names and archaeology and get our final contender or move across i'm good with that i'm good with that why don't we cruise Sick. down the soraya mulek and and go from there okay bust it out bro bust it out this is cool so soraya used to be a criticism of the text because it's a name that's not necessarily biblical you know there's 337 names in the book of mormon 188 of them were original to the book of mormon at the time that it was printed which means you know when the Book of Mormon was published in 1830, those names, you, you couldn't find them in another book or you couldn't find them in the Bible or you couldn't find them in the Old Testament. What was that stat again? That's pretty incredible. So there's 337 names in the Book of Mormon. 188 of them were original to the text at the time it was printed. 188 out of how many? 337. That's basically, that's a, that's a majority it's of over the half. names. Yes, yeah. Well over half. Wow. And a Holy number smoke. of them okay. have been discovered in the old world archaeologically. One such example. And so a lot of these that we're picking is like a good example out of a bigger bracket. All right. One such example is Soraya because that was criticized for a while. And then there was some papyrus discovered at a Jewish site in Elephantine, which dated to the fifth century BCE. And it included the name of Soraya. And so that was an archaeological discovery that identified a name that was once original. The only place you could find it in the world was within the Book of Mormon. And then they found it archaeologically in an Egyptian Jewish site in Elephantine in the 5th century B.C., demonstrating that it was a name from the Old World dating to roughly, I mean, it's a little bit after Lehi, but it, it would have gone backwards from there to the time period of, of Lehi and Nephi. So it certainly makes it plausible that Soraya was a a a, a, a true name that, that could have been drawn from from the record. One at one time it was original. Now it's been discovered in the archaeological record. Holy smoke! That's massive, bro. Yeah, it's a, it's a good sauce. How come this isn't okay? What? How come we are still? Where's that poster? Where where is that <laughs> stupid poster of? The, the, the Thomas B. Marsh bucket of cream story, you know what I'm saying, that we hear about all the time. How come that is not in – how come we don't teach this on Sunday school? Do you guys teach this in Sunday school? Yeah, you need to start coming to my Sunday schools, bro. Yeah, bro, like, holy smoke. At the church of Jesus Christ .org. Yeah, dot or rock on. <laughs> do live stream all of your Sunday schools. You know what I'm saying? Actually, there's there's a number of our services that you can, you can watch online. So. Okay, because, like, I swear, man, how is this not a BYU class? 
Like, how is this Sweet 16 of archaeological evidences of the Book of Mormon not a BYU class? And and how do we have all these silly, stupid, woke professors at BYU saying, like, oh, it's inspired fiction and can't be, like, real and stuff like that? Garden, you know, what's going on? We have some we have some awesome teachers at BYU that teach yes. this kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, this but that's, that's not what quick media kind of says. That's not what quick media says. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, I mean, quick media does some really good work focusing on problems, but there's also good stuff happening there too, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah but like, Doc, I never took, is there is is there an archaeological evidence is the Book of Mormon class at BYU? I don't know. Anybody? Any takers? I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know if I looked for that one specifically. There was a really cool Isaiah class. Ah. Uh. Okay, cool. All right. That is pretty awesome. I didn't know that there was 188 out of 337, if I remember correctly. Yep. You're, you're passing the test right now, Cardin. You're passing the test. Yeah. See, I should be the professor. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, um, wow, that is – okay, that's incredible. Yep. And and just to, just to uh, kind of – show on the screen i just looked this up and it apparently looks like interpreter foundation who still has the super awesome uh like 1996 donate via uh paypal button from like you know like 1998 on the top of the screen that's pretty hilarious uh, it has a super cool article about revisiting soraya at elephantine by Neil Rapoli. And then, yeah, look at this. He's got some awesome illustrations of the papyri found where Soraya was brought. This is so cool, my man. All right, so the next one. Brad, take it away, man. Are we going to vote? Okay. Oh, are we going to vote? Next yeah. up, well, we got to lay oh, off. we got to do Mulek. Mulek. And, and Jerry, I want to hear you yes. uh, give us the rundown on Mulek. Okay, um, well, I want to do a plug for Soraya, but... Um, <laughs> do oh, do that first, then. Yep. Yeah. yeah, do that. It actually means advisor, you know, in Hebrew, and... It's also, oh. yeah, and it's also. Wait, but if we didn't, if it was a new name that didn't exist, that means there couldn't have been Hebrew dictionaries that it existed in to say that it means advisor. Well, wait a so second. How so, like the I A H at the end of the name of Sariah would mean Yahweh. That's yeah. a root of Yahweh. Exactly. So you can you can find roots of etymology of the words without necessarily discovering it on a piece of paper. Yeah. Yeah, that was going to say advisor, and then the theof it's the theophoric shortened version of Yahweh is the ayah. Yeah. So, so actually, it actually has a. So, a, a so name. does it mean does it mean Yahweh or does it mean advisor? Like, I, and okay, by the I, way, it might be like a godly advisor yeah, or something yeah. like that, or Yahweh advises. You know. Yeah. Or, mm -hmm. yeah. So, oh, okay, cool. So, kind of like I am that I am also I mean, means one, one root is stubbornness, but we're not going to talk about that one. Oh okay. God. <laughs> <laughs> brutal, dude, brutal. But also, <laughs> again, it's fitting, right? It yeah, fits the story. Yeah. yeah, and then, actually, uh, if you look, if you actually figure out the chronology, um, there's a little bit of biblical typology going on there because she had the last, she was very old. Basically, you kind of estimate Laman and Lemuel, the older brother's age, and then yeah. and everything. Mm. So she was quite old um, when she had the children, which, you know, um, matches like Sarah. Yeah, yeah. So there may be some, and then probably. I mean, I I kind of propose that the two children were twins. So you have Jacob and Joseph. Jacob, of course, is mm. you know a twin. So there's more biblical typology cool. actually going on in that family. That's cool. So. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Rock on. Okay. Sick. And so I'm oh, sorry. Keep going, Jerry. Oh, and then the Mulek, I, did you you had something prepared, right, Josh, on that one? Yeah, we're going to do a deep dive on Mulek a little later, but I'll I'll do let me do the old world and you take the new world okay. part, okay? And we'll we're obviously going to some of these we're going to do some episodes card where we dive in a little deeper. But Rock on. Cool. Mulek, okay, so there was a uh, a little seal. These these seals are like the size of a dime, maybe a little smaller. And there was a seal discovered for Jeremiah's uh, scribe, Baruch OK, but cool. it was actually a long form of the name. And it looks like based on a seal that was discovered in the old world for Mulek, that Mulek might have been exactly like Baruch, like it was a short form version and a play on words in Hebrew because Mulek essentially goes comes from the Hebrew Melech for king. OK, so so it has the right etymology. He's the son of Zedekiah, the son of the king. And there's been a seal discovered in the old world that looks like it's the long form name of Mulek. 
Okay, and in the original manuscript, it was actually Muloch. It was M-U-L-O-C-H, I think, in the original manuscript. So there's old world evidence for the son of Zedekiah that is named in the Book of Mormon. What, where's this seal at now? Like, who's just, got it? Just look up Seal of Muloch uh, online, and it'll... You know, it'll come up. I, I, I don't know. Does the and, the and then there's New World evidence for Mulek okay. based on a Mesoamerican model. Okay, so seal of Mulek. All right, has a seal of Mulek been found? BYU Scholars Archive. All right, um, I'll be looking that up while you give the other evidence. Still want to see where it is. Oh my gosh, there's a picture. Great, I got to put this on the screen before this is so. In Brad, how come you never told me about this, Brad? You know, you're the one that always brings me the cool archaeological ideas, man. Pardon, I tried to tell you about yeah. this one. <laughs> I wanted to get you to name your son Melki Yahu Ben Himelech, <laughs> and you just were not having it. All right, that's funny. Wow, holy smoke, look at this. This is incredible. Has the seal of Mulek been found? Now I got to read this one, too. This is absolutely incredible. Okay. Dude, I this one... and. Uh, I want to add a tiny bit of context before we dive into Jerry's Please. side, just on a really high level note. People didn't know which of Zedekiah's children lived or died, right? And so for Joseph Smith to have been like, oh, yeah, by the way, uh, one of Zedekiah's kids totally lived and escaped over to the Americas. Here's his name. And then later on, we like figure out, oh, Zedekiah had a son by this name. You know, like that's pretty awesome, I think. Yeah. Yes. Jeez, it's powerful stuff. And so the ancient bore in the Judean countryside was a pit in which water was stored. Rope marks in the stone are evidence of years of drawing water. Jeremiah was lowered into such a bore, a pit or cistern in Jerusalem rather than into a dungeon. Photo courtesy of D. Kelly. Ogden. Wow, this is incredible. So I assume they what they found it inside one of those bores. What it slipped off the finger. Of I, somebody I don't like I actually think it was found on the black market, but it's it's been verified. And that's how a lot of discoveries are made in the old world is through mm -hmm. black market stuff. And then I they, will they try and verify. Am I right, Jerry? I think it was black market that it was found. Yeah. Uh, so but it and they try to cover that up every once in a while. Well, they, we, we talked to some of those guys. It on, was named a forgery at first, but but more research has been done. And, and there's really nobody that believes it's a forgery today. It, it looks legit. Wait so. until that happens with the Michigan artifacts, man. Boom. Oh, shaka, those laka. forgeries. Yeah, we can talk about those forgeries. <laughs> those clearly. <proven laughs> Clear, forgeries. Yes. The one that 100 percent of people believe are forgeries. Yeah. Uh, no true hey, Scots. Not 100. There are dozens of people who think they're not forgeries, okay? <laughs> dozens. You know the best part? Is, not in this but room. they might have an not argument. Not in this they room. Might have an argument. Yeah. What's funny is I don't even know exactly what the Michigan artifacts are. I just know whenever you say that, <laughs> that people always just like, you might as well have, I don't know, mentioned black coffee at breakfast with your grandma from Ogden. Well, you know this might saying? answer so. why, Cardin, I think uh -huh. there is a struggle with Book of Mormon and research is okay. until we raise the banner of scholarship to a level that might reach par in certain avenues, like the more we play games with artifacts that are fakes and try and assert them as real, we're not going to be able to play in the right arenas that we want to play in. So I think we need to raise the bar scholastically to a standard that's extremely high. And when we do that, then stuff like the Seal of Music, Mulek will land better. But if we're promoting fake artifacts and cherishing them as true artifacts defending the Book of Mormon when the entire archaeological community declares them as forgeries and fakes from the 18th or 19th century, we're probably not going to get very far. Okay, so actually, um, I, I really like that you say that, and I just want to ask you a question right now, because I'm... <coughs> I'm I'm a convert to this like like you're gonna win a soul to either my side or their side right now All right, do you really think? Do you really think that it's misbehavior in general? Um, by in archaeological enthusiasts uh, in the Mormon community making unsupported claims 
that makes it so that the archaeological community at large does not take Book of Mormon uh, evidences seriously, or because I got a no, feeling. No, not only, not only. Like I can because these are the same. Like I have such a disrespect for modern science. These are the idiots that shut down my kid's school, this, told me that I was a bad person if this, I didn't want to wear a mask this while is I was March jogging Madness, sweet on the 16, breach. Carden. You know, this is March Madness, Sweet Sixteen. There's both offense and defense. And okay. I'm describing. <laughs> I'm describing one end of the defense, man. So there's there's. There's a whole other ball end of the court. I'm not I feel saying like these not. people are gatekeeping, not non data driven. There's a whole other team playing that dogmatic. we're playing against. Sure, <laughs> but we can control how we play the game. We can't play control if somebody else. Is I playing don't dirty. like the personal responsibility avenue that you are taking here, and I far prefer to brush with a very broad stroke <laughs> all of my enemies. <laughs> as <laughs> I want a one three one half court pickup press, and then okay. a real real aggressive. <laughs> Of a lot of pick and rolls from the top offense. That's how okay. we're going to win the game. All right. So this one's amazing. Uh, what do we vote? Who? Who? Which you want, one? You want, the, you want the other side? Oh yeah, the other side. Sorry. Oh I yeah, the yeah, other Jerry, side. Go. It gets better, bro. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll be brief. But um, uh, Mayanist David Kelly back in the '60s, not LDS at all, uh, noted a Hebrew connection to the Maya calendar involving three sequential Maya day names that correspond with three sequential Hebrew letters. The day names are Manic, Lamed, and Mulek. The manic glyph is a hand and corresponds with the Yucatec Maya word for hand, cob. The corresponding Hebrew letter is kaf, same meaning. The next Hebrew letter is lamed. Uh, the Maya day, calendar day name is lamet. And uh, the Hebrew letter in sequence is mem, which means water. And the next sequential Maya calendar name is mulek, which also means water and features a fish in its glyph. The other correlation is there's kind of a... Dude. What, the, what what we call the Uncle Sam Stila at La Venta, yeah. which was where the, they supposedly landed. Look up La Venta Stila 3. I Did think you call it the Uncle Sam Steely? That other people call it, not me, because it has a beard. Um, looks, oh, I thought it was like an old Steely that says, like, you know, um, Uncle Sam wants you to read the Book of Mormon. Or get out the like hat. That, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, get out the hat. <laughs> it probably says that, but we don't know how to read those glyphs on that. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, so what's this? The fish uh, hat. What am I looking up? Yeah. What am I looking up now? La Venta, I think it's Stila 3. Well, okay. A Stila in, in like Mesoamerica, it, it's a large. Yeah, so La Venta, yeah. Stila 3. That should bring up. Okay. La, la, oh, La Venta, la Stila venta. 3. La Venta. Okay, here we go. All right, so here it is on your screen. Asking you shall receive. Here is yeah, La Venta. Well, try, to, try, to, try to find someone a who's made a, dra one. a drawing of that. But, uh, oh, a drawing easy. of that. Okay, might cool. be easier. But anyway, if you look at that, um, uh, well, that's not all. That's yeah. that's like cutting it up into little bits. So it's not. It's not yeah, I'll it find is. a better picture. Keep telling what what we're looking for while we look up for that picture. Yeah. So it kind of it kind of has like a little beard and that. He's the one on the right. But he is wearing a big fish. There head. you got it. Yep, right, yeah, right here. Right there. So he's if you, so the one on the right. Okay. He's if you look at his head, he's kind of has basically say he looks Semitic. He has a, a beard, and he has wearing a big fish headdress. You see the fish on. His yeah, head. yeah, I see it. I see it. Okay. Yeah, and the interesting thing is in the in the Reformed Egyptian, Mulek is also found in the characters document. And the glyph, he has a title, and it's in Egyptian, it means like administrator or vizier. We know he wasn't a king. Okay. And Zerim Hamlin wasn't a king. And actually, the glyph form, it's a fish on top of walking legs. So, oh, interesting. Yeah. So you kind of have these correlations going on there. So you think that correlates with this? Kind of, I don't want to say fishy because that always has a, a negative connotation, but this um, a very aquatic headdress that we have on this little guy on the right. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, I mean, it looks like there is correlation with the individual that we're talking about. There is another at La Venta, they call it the Ambassador Monument. Okay. Um, it, I, I, I'm thinking this is actually after he was there for a while and actually had a title and that kind of thing. So that Stila seems to be showing a foreigner coming in, and that's part of the the identification, right? Yeah, so. he looks and again they basically say he looks he looks like he's from the near east near eastern dress. And actually the one glyph on the bottom um on the right. Okay. You, yeah, probably if you had a drawing of that too, but it's yeah. it actually is a little it's a turkey vulture with a head uh basically a headband. Okay. That in 
in the Maya anyway means a king or a ruler from a foreign mm. land, from a foreigner a foreign land. So, oh dang, yeah. So and and so this was found in La Venta, which is on the isthmus of Tehuantepec in Mexico. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah, and the actual the dating of those uh, is like six hundred to four hundred BC where they're finding them in that range. So it matches. Oh, oh wow. Yeah, the correlation's pretty good uh, in terms of. So there's some name matching on the glyphs that tie to Mulek. Yeah. We and can, and we can't, I mean. We can't read the other two that are above it because exactly. they're kind of, they're eroded out. We don't, we wouldn't know anyway. This was actually one of the first writings that's recorded in, Mes- in Mesoamerica, believe it or is not. Is this thing on the screen right now? If I put this, this is one of the first early recordings right here? Of, of writing, Yeah. Wow, and this, I mean, there's three glyphs, and then there's well, and the, and the little footprint on the left. Yeah, that means traveler, and, and wow. all over Mesoamerica. So it's somebody that's traveling. That's why they called him the ambassador or whatever. So it, it correlates, and I'm kind of saying I think that looks like when he first arrived, and then the other one is kind of showing him after he'd been there for a while because we know that they lived. See, they arrived. At this, the Jaredites were not gone. They arrived in Jaredite territory. Right. It says they landed in the land of desolation. Right. That's where they landed. So. There was some overlap between them, and that's why, you know, when they left, the Coriantumr was familiar with them. They went, you know, went to, to the people of Zarahemla. It says that they battled much with the sword. I mean, Omni doesn't tell us much uh, before they migrated up. So the correlation is really good. Um, so dating to the right time in the right place of a Mesoamerican model, there's archaeological evidence for Mulek in both the Old World and, and New. Mm-hmm. Wow, this is cool. Okay, uh, Brad, you got anything to say before I read our super chat? Like thirty minutes after it came in. Oh <laughs> no! Know, it's, no <laughs> yeah, it's, okay. I, I think we're ready to vote on Soraya B. Mulek, so we can do the super chat if you want. Okay, first. Swenson Bailey, thank you very much for the super chat. Says if the resurrection is real, so are the gold plates. Amen. Thank you. Hallelujah! Bro. Boom! <laughs> That's it. Yeah, yeah, I love it. That's what we're talking totally about. Agree. That's what we're talking about. Okay, so now I'm going to put this back up on the screen so everybody here can see it. Here's our Book of Mormon, Sweet 16, Evidences, Soraya and Mulek. I think Mulek is just cooler because there's a physical seal, man. Again, yeah. I'm mm-hmm. just, I'm a guy. And that that's likes Stella to... 3? What the heck? That's awesome. But it's also sexist not to choose Soraya. And with the whole hullabaloo that we've had over the Relief Society this week, I think I choose Soraya. <laughs> I choose the safe. I choose the I'm, safe I'm voting alternative. Mulek. As a church Mulek's that ordains cool. women into an office of deaconess, I'm going to go with Mulek because I just feel very safe either way. Yeah. <laughs> You're funny. That's awesome. Okay, cool. So we've got. I'm I'm abstaining. I don't want to offend anybody. You're abstaining. You're abstaining the vote. Okay, so we've got Nehom beat Jershon and Mulek beat Soraya because everybody but me is sexist here. And um, okay, head to head, which one wins? It's going to be Nehom versus Mulek. Both have a physical artifact, which is cooler. And as much as the Mulek artifact is cool and was found on the black market. So it has that edgy vibe, like that boyfriend you bring home that rides a motorcycle and has a helmet and mom (laughs) thinks he's cool, but dad's like, what are you up to? And there's like that edginess to it. You know what I'm saying? It's not as, it just, it's not as cool as the three altars that have that like sacred. And there's, there's also a location. You can't pilgrimage to a little seal that belongs on a, on a ring. You can Mm -hmm. pilgrimage to an altar. And if I'm going to set up a cult that wears togas and makes pilgrimage, Images. I want it to, you know, that's just cooler to me. So I think Nahom beats Mulek. No, no. If you read Mulek backwards, it means kill him. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, Way more edgy. I, I take my, I take it back, bro. I take it back. The dark magic of Mulek totally Dude, swamps Nahom. I, I have got to say, for me, I think Mulek actually beats Nahom. Uh, because, really? Because, like, yeah, because it's compounded not just by the artifact itself that's there, but by the fact that Joseph Smith managed to identify a son of Zedekiah whose name we didn't know, and it feasibly is the name of a son of Zedekiah, and that he ends up across in the Americas at the right time, and there's an artifact there which you can pilgrimage to. Like, this is awesome. I really, who really owns like the Mulek this? evidence. Who owns this little seal? Who owns it? Where is it? I don't know. Dang it. I think the article says, but I can't remember. Okay, cool. All right. I'll have to, I'll have to read into it. All right. I, I vote I vote Nahum. It's just my favorite. Okay. 
So we got two for Nehom. So Nehom beats Jershon. Uh, uh, Mulek beats Soraya. But um, I changed my vote. No, actually, I don't change my vote because I went with Jim Gee and he found the map. So out of loyalty to Jim Gee, I chose Nehom. Sorry, Brad, you're toast. No, I'm just kidding. Wait, wait, wait. Are we 2-2? Two, two? We're 2-2. Two, two. He's still... Oh, Jerry, yes. What do you think? It, uh, is it is it Nehom or Mulek? What vote, do you think? I vote for Jershon. No. Yeah. <laughs> you vote for Jershon just to tie it? To uh, s- you know, I like Mulek. I mean, Nehom's good, but... Yeah, he's kind okay. of, well. It's it's I mean, some Mulek, of Jerry's Mulek, research. He looks got like Mulek, a lot yeah. of different angles to it, right? Ed, so it's got Mesoamerican. You're a tiebreaker. Yeah, Ed's, Ed's, Ed's the tiebreaker. tiebreaker. What what do you say, Ed? Personally, I'm a Nahum guy. Oh, you're a Nahum guy. Okay, it's just a so. Thing I've got. Oh dang. Yeah. All right. All right so Nahum advances. Sorry, Jerry. Nahum advances to the I'll names. Get I'll get you guys next time. He, tie on the tiebreaker. Yeah. That was overtime. That was overtime. That was overtime. You're right. So Nehom advances to the championship of the names and archaeology. Okay, cool. Gosh, man, we, we only have like, we're already an hour in. We're already into overtime. You know what I'm saying? Ourselves. Speaking we'll of overtime. We'll start going faster. Yeah, let's just burn through the rest of these really fast. Um, I uh, Let's go to what? Geology? Language? Plates? What do you choose? Jerry. Jerry, what do you choose? Uh, let's try to sell some more books for Josh. Let's go to plates. All right. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right. Rock on. Let's do Five it. Five bucks okay. is coming to Jerry after this live stream ends. <laughs> yeah. Rock on. So sweet. Hit it, my man. My books are all free, so they're not really worth it. <laughs> yeah. My books raise money. Every book sold raises money for translations of the Book of Mormon around the world. So oh, every sick. penny. Every Rock penny. On. So this research that I did was comparing the evidence for the resurrection of Christ and overlaying that with the evidence for the Book of Mormon. But out of these four on the plate side, evidence for the plates, you have the eyewitnesses. We could do this quick. Eyewitnesses are just the fact that we have uh, multiple women that held the plates, handled the plates, moved the plates around in the, in the room, Catherine Salisbury, which was Joseph Smith's sister, uh, she claimed that on the night he brought him home and passed him through the window, she held the plates and uh, set him on a set him on a table. So you have a lot of you have Isaac Hale, who was a non-believer, who said that he handled a box with the plates inside. It was the correct weight, roughly. You have all these. You have about twenty-one different people that handle the plates and are witnesses to that. Not to mention the three and the eight witnesses themselves. And you even have an unbeliever, Jos- or a believer, excuse me, a convert, Josiah Stoll, who at one time funded Joseph's money digging. And then the night that Joseph brought him home, he passed him through the window. Josiah Stoll grabbed the plates. The frock lifted, and he testified under oath that he saw the golden plates that night. So. We, oh really? Yeah, and we even have his his So it's not like Indiana Jones and the like the the lost <laughs> ark where like his face melted or something sick like that. My whip and fedora I left at home, but no, we uh yeah. we've got him <laughs> we've got him uh got him at the ready. But uh, so the eyewitnesses obviously that's a gem. Just a gem. You know, if if this was anything other than the miraculous, we wouldn't even have this as a question as to what actually happened in regarding the uh, the artifacts and what was said. And Jerry's work tied to the eyewitnesses on Ziff, his his work, Ziff and the Magic Goggles, that book, you know, he laid out and I ended up putting some of this e- effort into the book where you have six or seven different people that describe the color. They're all describing roughly the, the right, correct weight within a certain range. Okay, yeah. they're describing the fact that they are engravings. Two different people describe the fact that there's a black patina on the engravings. Random facts that are given describing the binding, the reverse D binding on the plates, given by multiple people independently attesting to what they saw on the gold plates from all the different witnesses. And when you lay that out, you have six or seven people describing this, and it's all describing clearly the same artifact that they saw that was procured that they held and handled for themselves. So the eyewitnesses are an unbelievably strong thing that I would argue is just as strong for the historical evidence of the resurrection, the resurrected body of Christ. I got a question for you, bro. You're yeah. an evangelist, Dang. okay? And Brad, you you've been a missionary, and all of us have been missionaries for our church. Like, <clears throat> why? Okay, I I do believe that cultivating a relationship with God so that you understand personal revelation and the revelatory experience of taking Ronai's promise and Ronai ten four, just as you said at the beginning of this podcast. Josh, I do believe that is the ultimate 
yeah. um, the, the, the ultimate knowledge. You know, etymology dictates that naturalistic observation is not the only way to find knowledge. And, and you really want to be just like a V8 is going to be firing on all eight cylinders. You want to be firing on all eight inputs, all eight etymological inputs that we have. I'm sorry, epistemological um, inputs that we have for knowing knowledge. So you have to receive personal revelation to have a testament of the Book of Mormon. But why don't we do more archaeological evidences in our evangelism, in our missionary work of the Book of Mormon? Why isn't there an awesome tract that we can't give out as LDS missionaries or as Church of Jesus Christ missionaries that just says amazing archaeological evidences for the Book of Mormon? Hey, look, did you know there's 30 people that witnessed the Book of Mormon. And yes, did you know that there's no way Joseph Smith could have known about Nahum, could have known about Tumbaga, could have known about this, 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 this. I, if I were just a normie, one of the uninitiated, and I was sitting on college campus, okay, and some sweet sister missionaries walked by or some cool Chad elders walked by and they said, hey, you know, uh, I, here's a tract on how prayer can help you. That would be in the same part of my mind as, oh, my buddy's a Buddhist. I should probably go to his temple one of these times and learn how to meditate better, right? But if some, somebody came up with a track that said, hey, dude, did you know there's a record of Jesus Christ in the Americas that actually checks out archaeologically and it gives you spiritual guidance as well? I, I would be intrigued. How come our church doesn't lead, at least in some tracks somewhere, with some of these archaeological evidences? Because this... To a guy with a mind like mine, that's what would hook me. That would hook me more than like, oh, here's a sweet message from our Relief Society president, you know, like no disrespect to the Relief Society president. But it's like, how come we're not, how come we don't like lead with this kind of stuff? Does that make sense? Anybody? I hear what you're saying. Okay. Oh, all right. So I, I, guess I think that for me, the reason that we don't lead with this kind of stuff, um, first off, I don't think it's all settled. Right. And then it leads directly into the arena of, OK, well, what evidence is for do we have? What anachronisms are still left? Right. It leads into a conversation about whether or not it's physically true. And rather than getting you to, like, turn to God. Right. Where I think God set up the Book of Mormon for us to understand it the way that he did in large part so that we would have to choose for ourselves. I think it's fascinating because I think there, while there is not enough evidence out there to prove the Book of Mormon, there's also enough evidence out there to make it like very compelling to me that like we cannot just ignore it, right? Yeah. But I think God has left it in a gray area so that we have to choose for ourselves whether or not we're going to accept this miracle and accept it into our lives and choose him. Okay, speaking of accepting the miracle and being convinced, Snaggart says, my brain says Mezzo, but my heart says Heartland. So uh, apparently, yeah, like Heartland is like the edgy boyfriend that shows up for Thanksgiving in a motorcycle jacket and a helmet, you know, which frankly is a really cool and fun place to be as a guy who was that boyfriend very often. So um, what do you guys say uh, about uh, eyewitnesses? Now it's manuscripts. Okay. Manuscripts, my man, who's talking manuscripts go Josh. Well, what I was going to just say about this and then I don't mean oh, okay. to just run the whole conversation. So when, when it, it comes to manuscripts, it's just the fact that we have, 28% of the original manuscript extant. We have the entire printer's manuscript. On the printer's manuscript, we have the first copy of the the witness statement and the eight, you know, the three witness statement, the eight witness statement. So you have, imagine if you had the first copy of a record from Jerusalem that was signed by the apostles saying we'd seen the risen Christ. We have that for the Book of Mormon through the printer's manuscript. And so when you have the original manuscript and the printer's manuscript, we have evidence for even how the Book of Mormon came forth. Some of the work from Royal Skousen and others that they've done actually demonstrates the fact that the, the text was being read aloud and dictated exactly as witnesses who were the scribes in the room describe. So you have verification for the process at which the Book of Mormon came forth, not necessarily a direct evidence of the plates, but of the process of translation. Okay. Rock on. Sick. So what wins? Eyewitnesses or manuscripts? I don't know. Put it to a vote. What do you say? Dude, I'm going manuscripts. You're going manuscripts? Manus and let me tell you why. Yeah. Because it. as an author, 
the fact that the Book of Mormon is essentially a first draft is insane. Yeah. I don't think people realize just how big of a deal that is. But Riley and I, we did like three drafts before we even sent it to our editor. And then after having our editor look at it, we, we did additional drafting, right? Like the fact that it is the way that it is with one draft, that is a miracle all by itself. So I'm going with manuscripts. Okay. I'm going with what you go with. Because that's a pretty solid argument right there. I hadn't thought of it that way. You have won my heart and my mind. That was easy. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, I'm doing manuscripts. <clears throat> oh, I'm going to be the lone eyewitnesses and get overruled, which is great. Okay, cool. Rock on. Manuscripts advance. By the way, why do we only have 22% of the uh, original manuscript? What happened to the other 78%? So it was being kept in the cornerstone of, was it the Nauvoo Temple or the Na- Kirtland? Nauvoo House. Nauvoo, Nauvoo House. The, yeah. the Nauvoo House. And it ended up getting water damage. Oh, okay. That was the thing that they had to dig out of the corner there. And then they realized uh, they mm-hmm. what, they had sealed it in cement, right? But cement had gotten through or something? By they, Joseph. Oh, jo- Joseph. Yeah, had. Joseph did. He sealed it there. Yeah. So, wow. And it was dug up and they... S- Edelman sold all these different pieces of it. And yeah, so it was kind of like and Emma's second scrap. husband sold off a bunch of the Scraps papers too. Stuff, so. they had to, oh, they had to try that to collect chump! It all <laughs> oh, that chump! Well, the, the cool thing is, it might mean that there's some floating pieces around somewhere. Yeah, I mean that's possible. Dude, I'm gonna find him. It's a, it's a race between Reed Moon and John Hayek at this time. <laughs> say, at this yeah. point, bro, you know I don't have the money for that, but they do. <laughs> yeah. You know, so that's funny. That's awesome. So okay, then uh, empty stone box and enemies. Yeah, let's burn through these in the last ten minutes, my man. Last ten minutes, we got empty stone boxes and enemies. Hit it, Josh. Go. Okay, so empty stone box. Uh, these these actually overlap a little bit, but the empty stone box. The point that I'm going to make here is based on uh, published testimonies that we have. We have 16 total sources that reference the hill and the hole in the ground in New York. Out of those 16 sources, some of them are friendly, some of them are foe. Okay, but these are the sources that we have available to us. Nine reference a general hole or a place of excavation where the plates were procured. They're not giving an exact location or anything, but they're saying, hey, yeah, there was a hill. There was a hole in the hill that is the hill in question in New York where the plates came forth. Four of them say they came from the side of the hill. Four of them are saying it was on a side that was at or near the top of the, or the, of the summit. Five different uh, witnesses describe it being a hill that was at near the summit on the west side of the hill. That comes from Joseph Smith, Oliver Cowdery, Edward Stevenson, an unnamed local that Edward Stevenson was referencing, and a critic to the movement, Lorenzo Saunders. Those are the five sources that define the location of the hill being on the west side. You have one very late source that says it was on the east side of the hill, but that was late third hand, indirect, and it was also from somebody that said he got the plates in 1826. So it has inaccuracies and errors. So we can kind of put that one on the shelf as maybe not being the best descriptor. We have five reports of seeing the, the box and the stone casket. That's that where the plates were taken out from. Joseph, Oliver, Martin, David, and the unnamed local that was interviewed by Edward Stevenson. So you have multiple independent attestation that there was an, a hole in the ground. That hole in the ground was a specific place on a specific hill as described by multiple people across multiple interviews. I have some additional information of what's in the box. So yeah. it's a little bit... Jump in. Yeah, this is more. Yeah. This is and, more, and while he's doing it, let's pull yeah. back up the bracket. And I think that this portion of the bracket is behind uh, us when you're talking. So if you, while Jerry's speaking, if you can move it so people can see this portion we're discussing right now. Okay, cool. Rock on. Yeah, this is, again. Yeah, I've been doing that, by the way. I've just been putting up the browser instead of the browser with the. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, I, I'm one step ahead of you, baby. So anyway, keep going. Yeah. Yeah, one, one thing I've been working on is the strangeness of what was in the box, of the items in the box, right? Yeah. Because it's like spectacles. Why are we what, – what's going on with spectacles? And and why did they why did he, why did he wrap it, you know, immediately after he took it out in cloth? Why was the breastplate wrapped? Well, in Mesoamerica – so I, I'm actually saying this is the greatest – one of the greatest archaeological finds of Mesoamerica in New York. <laughs> uh, essentially, in Mesoamerica – they pass down the relics just like they do other places, but they actually do it in the form of a sacred bundle. 
and they are wrapped, it have to always be wrapped in cord, sacred cords and cloth. And only the high priest is allowed to do that and hold them. So you basically have Moroni burying what we, what we're putting in the box, what I call a sacred relic, uh, a sacred bundle. The bundles typically contained often records. They contained basically, um, uh, in this case, divinatory items. Now, what's a divinatory item? Well, the goggles. In Mesoamerica, you have goggles. Like, what do the bones say? Yeah. Here's the bones. Well, in Mesoamerica, you actually have goggles that are worn by different gods and in a divinatory. You see them on statues as a divinatory tool, um, partially. So you actually have, it's a Mesoamerican item, is what I'm telling you. That's why, that's why it's in the form of these spectacles. And they were described as being silver, but not being blackened by tarnish. The only metal that does that is platinum. And that was actually mined in Central, only place it was ever mined anciently, and it was in Central America. So the Nephites put that together. Put They had to be the ones to put the spectacles on. It talks about an ether of the stones, but nothing about spectacles. The other thing is this breastplate. Well, in Mesoamerica, and, and it was described as being concave and convex. In Mesoamerica, they would wear divinatory breastplates that were concave mirrors um, as part of their process. And, and oh. the, yeah, and the, and the kings would wear them. Because they give you all these funky, it's like a spoon. If you take it and, and put it away from you, it has different. Like the reverse of Madonna in the 90s. Yeah, it has different focal points. So it shifts, and then and they could use it for all kinds. They could start fire with it and all kinds of things like that. So really what you're talking about is a divinatory breastplate yeah. that's in there. And then they also had what's called, they had weapons in there, but they were effigy weapons, which are basically a weapon that they would raise, and the power of that sacred we weapon would go to all of their soldiers or warriors' weapons. And you see that in the Book of Mormon where it says, Benjamin raised the sword of Laban, right? And so you actually have all the elements of a Mesoamerican sacred bundle. Um, mm. and, and they also had, you know, they used the, the, awesome. the mirrors are also a divinatory method. So anyway, Very so the cool. box was empty, but there was actually, uh, I mean, I'm kind of working, this is an explanation as to why all of these things, explaining what they were. And, and the and, empty and, box matters, like like to that point of all these things that were extracted out, for the same reasons of why it would be valid to say, hey, go look at the empty tomb, right? So within proximity of Palmyra, where the Book of Mormon was printed, if you wanted to know if Joseph Smith got something, you, would, you could go to the hill and see for yourself, and several did. And so when you actually get to the early witnesses, I'm going to transition right over to enemies, the next point. Yeah, rock on. Is the fact that, you know— Enemies of the movement are what propelled David Whitmer and Oliver Cowdery. Okay, David Whitmer comes to visit Palmyra, and when he does, he encounters a bunch of people that were spreading this rumor about the plates, and he investigates them. He says, well, what makes you think he has anything? They said, well, we've been to the hill. We've seen the, the fact that he, there was a hole in the ground in a stone box. So according to David Whitmer, and, and that's the testimony that then propels Oliver Cowdery to start investigating this stuff. So two of our three witnesses find out about what's going on in the movement, and their testimony to investigate it further is the testimony of enemies. Okay, and so when you look at the Smiths, they're getting persecuted so much that Joseph has to flee to, to Harmony, Pennsylvania, to continue translation after he procures the plates. Yeah. Why is he doing that? Why does anybody believe that this young, young nobody actually found something? What would make people think that? Yeah. It's because the hill was close enough. You could go and see for yourself and you could see the fact that there was an empty tomb. You want to, or an empty, uh, uh, an empty stone box, but it, just the same way as go see the empty tomb for yourself, go see the hill in the ground in New York. Same deal, same comparison. So the enemies were persecuting the Smiths. Why were they doing that? They thought he had something. Why did they think he had something? Are there any records of people having actually seen? I think Don Bradley might have talked about this. Are there any records of people having gone and seen the stone box? Yeah, there's and, there's uh, five reports independent that verify the fact that there was a, a a stone box in the hill. Okay, now where 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 is that now? It is in the book witnessing. No, miracles. I mean the stones. Yeah. <laughs> There that's, you go. That's awesome. <laughs> I vote that wins. That I'm thing. voting for that one. Yeah. So well, the the latest account that we have was like so Edward Stevenson when he goes to investigate the situation and he finds a local. Basically, what seems to happen is eventually the hill gets plowed over. Okay, but it it becomes a farm field, 
Okay, and so the stone box Same farmers. Yeah. So the box seems to get broken up, and eventually the local reported that it was basically uh, got put down at the bottom of the hill, and the stones were were either broken up or taken away. So the stone box, which should have been the artifact everybody was going after early to keep and preserve, yeah. is left on the hill for years, and farmers just end up probably busting it up, and it, it gets carried down and just... Just the number one thing you get rid of are tree stumps and big stones when you're trying to fa- when you're trying to farm. Yeah. So, yeah. dang it. Okay. Um, all right, guys. Please make sure you're hanging out here. Uh, you like this stream. All right. We're gonna burn through the rest of these really fast and make our decisions about what we're gonna do when we record. Uh, this week. So please make sure you like the stream. Also, we've got a new member in the chat and you know, I haven't been plugging and pushing for super chats because I've been so intrigued by this. If you guys have any questions that you guys want to ask either Jerry Grover or Josh Gailey before we get out of here in the next 10 minutes, please make sure that you send us a super chat and uh, we'll read that. Until then, uh, we've received the records of one hot sauce Brother or Sister Hot Sauce. That's a great YouTube name right there. <laughs> brother or Sister Hot Sauce. And we've received the records of Brother or Sister Salsa Hot Fuerte. Sauce <laughs> into the ward, in the Ward Radio Wigwam. So those that would like to uh, welcome this member, Hot Sauce, please put a W in the chat. So W for Hot Sauce. Rock on. There we go. Okay, so here's the uh, last of the graphic really fast. Let's burn through the right side now. Who wins, uh, Stone Box or Enemies? Who wins that? Stone Box. Stone Box. Stone Box? Yeah, Stone Box totally takes the cake. And Stone Box versus Manuscripts. Uh, Stone Box versus Manuscripts. Manuscripts is cooler than Stone Box because they're still around. And the yeah, idea, the manuscript is sick. Yeah, and the I'm I, down with that. I'm down with that. And the idea that John Hayacek might call me up one day and be like, a friend of a friend of a friend told me that they got some manuscripts and I checked them out and I authenticated and guess what I got? And with that bow tie, I might be having a video camera taking a picture of that with him someday. Or else the idea that Reed Mood might just call me up, you know what I'm saying? And as he's flipping through some book and some awesome, you know, Mormon uh, antiquities procurement collection, there might be some like... You know, used as a bookmark in a second, you know, printing version of of the the Book of Mormon that he found in some private collection somewhere. There might be a copy of the original manuscript. That's just awesome. I like the idea of that. So manuscripts versus Nahum and the one side of the bracket is done. Uh, Nahum's cooler because it's ancient. Yeah, that's what I say. Mm. Jerry. Yeah, that's okay. I, I think both are pretty close, but yeah. You don't make an Indiana Jones episode about a freaking 1830s manuscript. You make an Indiana Jones episode out of uh, a, an altar. It's somewhere in the Middle East, and you're wearing an Indiana Jones shirt, bro. That's it. You're literally in the Indiana Jones shirt, so we're going Indiana Jones on this one. Hands down, nay home. I don't know, man. It's manuscript for me. I know I'm getting beat on this one, but... It's good. Home's pretty it's good. Soon. You're Canadian. Canadians are weak. We're moving on. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be just kidding. <laughs> so, um, actually, hey, is the worldwide sniper record still held by a Canadian, or was that uh, overdone? For like 15 or 16 years, it was a Canadian that got the the longest kill with a sniper rifle. Yeah, let me see. Uh, yeah, you it can look is, that up. It now belongs to a Russian. Ah. He shot, he shot that guy. All right. Yeah, he shot that guy. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. It's a Ukrainian who killed a Russian. Oh. See, there you go. Hardcore. Okay. <laughs> that wow. has happened. Was that another ja- chat GPT answer in real in, in real time? Uh, no, was this that... was Google right now. Oh, that, that was Google. Was chat the... GPT would have been like, yeah, no, Canadian still got it, bro. Yeah, no, it was, 100%. A, it, was, it was an Argentine fighting with a Brazilian, and it was on a bath towel in the middle of Rio de Janeiro. I would have said guns are outlawed in Canada. <laughs> Sorry yeah, about the real. algorithm, Cardin. Sorry about the algorithm. Yeah, seriously. Just tanked. Yeah, just tanked, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, okay, cool. So burning through the rest of this really fast we got another five minutes here got another five minutes um it, we've got chiasmus hebraisms udo aztecan reformed egyptian destruction land of nephi volcano tumbaga and bountiful uh let's do geology bracket jerry grover go uh i guess destruction is talking about the third nephi destruction basically that the description given in the book of mormon matches uh, known geological events and we can actually at least in mesoamerica identify uh, pretty much where they were. The Heartland model also has a theory about the new Madrid fault. So 
um, it actually um, does give evidence of the Book of Mormon that it actually occurred. The Land of Nephi volcano, that is one, of, one from my publication on the geology of the Book of Mormon, that you actually have a, a description in the Land of Nephi, um, a different geological event, where there was a cloud, earthquake, cloud, earthquake, cloud, earthquake. So it looks like a volcanic earthquake, erupt, small eruption with earthquakes. Yeah. And there's actually an equation. And so the Sorensen model tells you where that city is. It, there's an active volcano that if there's a calculation that a Russian has in, uh, come up with called the Zobin equation, where you can actually calculate the distance away based on the shaking intensity. And it actually matches. That correlates very well. Wow, okay. And then the Tumbaga is basically just the metallurgy of the plates. One of the possibilities is Tumbaga, which is a copper, silver, uh, gold, or at least could be gold, copper alloy that has depletion gilding treated surface so that you get a uh, layer of uh, pure gold or, well, majority gold on the surface, which seems to match the weight and everything that described um, of the plates. So, it was, and, it was, and the technology was known in the old world and also the new world uh, to do that. The, um, the, let's see, remind me on Bountiful. Bountiful is the question of the fact that Nephi, first there's a place Bountiful yeah, okay. that matches in, Sa in the Saudi Arabian Peninsula. Yeah. Okay, you're talking about- Matches on... the description. This is Old World Bountiful. In right. Oman. And right. with, Kofort. Yep. And within Kor Kofort, there's actual place where there's iron ore that has basically, I, this is a non-technical term, Jerry, so forgive me, but it's basically bubbled up to the surface that could be broken up and, sh and smelted down into tools exactly as Nephi described. So it's not a deposit that you would find- very many places in Saudi Arabia. I think that's a safe thing to say. So, uh, Jerry, that was that was kind of what I was going for was the geological discovery of iron ore in Bountiful that would match Nephi's description of being able to make his own tools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the mountain, nice. actually, the mountain actually where they think it took place. I mean, where the iron ore is is actually they think is I can't remember the name in the Bible, but it's actually a mountain that's named in the Genesis, which one of the etymologies is place of speaking of the prophet or something cool. like that so cool <laughs> it has some correlation wow rock on okay uh so to tumbaga v bountiful uh what do you think brad what do you think which one wins dog dude okay i always wondered what the heck ziff was and then jerry grover comes in like a magician and finds it in some ancient arabic dictionary showing that it's like this uh, fool's gold, effectively, right? Like this copper that has a gold gilded alloy to it, and that it would be the perfect thing to write on. So, like, I mean, it's got to be Tumbaga for me. Okay, rock on. It's so awesome. Because it was probably, Tumbaga was probably what the Nephites called Ziff. Yeah, it's a, it, was, it was a counterfeit, um, basically metal. And it's interesting because it was used, we talked about this before, it was used as... Yeah. As money among the jinn and Akbar, matching King Noah, evil King Noah. And, yeah. And, so, and, and genie money is just awesome. Yeah, yeah dude, exactly. That's so freaking <laughs> sick. I want the cool pointed shoes and everything, man. I'm too baga. Everything, I'm too baga all the way. Yeah, everything Disney says is is Arabian, I'm sure is historically accurate. So <laughs> anyway, um, okay, Tumbaga wins. Uh, last six really fast. Destruction versus Land of Nephi in three sentences. Hit it. Oh, no, we already did Destruction's that. Destruction's yeah. a bigger boom. We got to vote destruction. It's a bigger boom. Okay, cool. Rock on. I like Land of Nephi because it has a big complex mathematic equation oh, in it. Nice. <laughs> okay. That's I'm... why I don't like it, Jerry. <laughs> no. I was a theater major, and that hurts me. I look at the math, and I just... That's funny. So before Start we go... Shakespeare. Before we go, and we're going to let the audience vote in the next one. Before we go, Udo Aztecan versus Reformed Egyptian in language brad do you want to take that one or do you want to assign it to josh and jerry i think josh and jerry will do a better job i can maybe give you a really fast overview give us the fast and then overview. they can fill it out yes so uto aztecan is a super interesting thing that i think is maybe one of the most compelling evidences of the book of mormon Amen. it has uh brian stubbs has done this work to identify these uh artifacts of hebrew and Egyptian morphological shifts that would have been injected into the Uto-Aztecan language group 
in around the time that the Nephites would have arrived. And there's evidence of these words still around in all of these Uto Aztecan language groups. And it fits the model of the area and the way that the Nephites would have expanded into the land northward if we're looking at a Mesoamerican model. So it's not only a really solid evidence for the Book of Mormon, it's also a really solid evidence for the Mesoamerican setting of the Book of Mormon. And I think something that helps show where it might have been is really cool. So that's high level Uto Aztecan, um, high level Reformed Egyptian. Um, and maybe maybe I'm in the wrong zone on this one. But what's really cool about the Reformed Egyptian is the characters document that is written down that some people call deformed English is literally full of like demotic and hieratic characters that are slightly modified, right? Like exactly what you would expect to happen over time. And when it's copied down by somebody else who it wasn't their original language. So you have actual evidence of this reformed Egyptian and from a different angle, Nephi talking about recording the things in the language of his fathers, but using Egyptian to record it is something that would have seemed anachronistic at the time. But then later on, it's like, oh, hey, no, now we're finding these Jewish people keeping I, the records in dark, hieratic and demotic and Egyptian. Number systems, yeah, dating to the yeah. time period of, of Lehi that are, are keeping basically a lot of low level. You don't have any like scripts like Book of Mormon script, but you have like hieratic Egyptian being used by Hebrews to write in like tax records and stuff like that. So yeah. Also yeah. everybody that's coming home from date night and joining our chat all of a sudden, we had a bunch of people that just jumped into the chat. Uh, welcome. Glad, hope, hope date night went well. And you dropped your babysitters off on time. You know, uh, if you guys have anything you want to say, send us a super chat. Also, don't forget to like the stream as you come into the stream. Unfortunately, coming at, at it towards the end, we're going to be wrapping up here with our sweet 16 bracket of the evidences of the Book of Mormon. And we're going to put it up to a vote in the chat here of the last one, I believe. Oh, wait, no, no. Let's go. The, no, the audience has to vote on Udo Aztecan versus Reformed Egyptian. Can I add one more thing? On yeah, this? add one more thing. Uh, the Udo Aztecan, there's like 1,700. Yeah. Semitic and Egyptian terms. It's not some small thing. Yeah, wow. it's huge. Yeah. And, and, so. and using the comparative method, about 100 cognate connections that way would be evidence of some cross-reference within the language groups. So, yeah. you know, you don't have 100, you have 17 times that. Yeah, so. the, other, the interesting thing is when Brian wrote the book, it was actually, there were problems in Udo Azteca that they couldn't figure out. This solves yeah, well, it explains what's what's going on. With what the were language. some of the problems? Well, it's just that the way the conjugations were done didn't seem to match, or you know, a certain of the verbs. But if you use the Egyptian, then it actually makes sense. Like these words don't fit this language group. Why are they there? How yeah, well, does this <clears throat> line up? There's gaps within this this family tree of languages. And and it's kind of like the odd Greek words that show up in Spanish. Like in Spanish, exactly you say right. like el mapa, for example. And it's the only word besides el programa, the other Greek word, that ha ends with an A and starts with an L. And so any alien from space looking at Spanish would say, okay, this is a, this is a grammatically incorrect error in the sentence. No, it's not. It's because the word is Greek and was so popularized in Greek. And, 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 and the Greeks, I guess, invented the word mapa that um, even from ancient times, Times, whenever somebody sees a map, they use the Greek term in Spanish so much so that now the official Spanish term is el mapa. So um, yeah, that's why the book's name is explan the explanatory power of Egyptian and Semitic yeah. in you know Aztec meaning it's a, Brian. It's not, uh, it's not a Book of Mormon book. It's actually just saying hey, just they, a research they, text. Yeah, these are there, and if you utilize them, then actually some of the language shifts and sound shifts actually make more sense. Okay, cool. So audience, audience, put it. To a vote right now, which one wins? Because we're going to be recording some of this uh, tomorrow when we do some uh, recording some videos. It's going to be super fun. What do you think wins? The arguments that are Udo Aztecan or the Reformed Egyptian arguments? Oh, did we say what the Reformed Egyptian arguments are? Or yeah, yeah, we did. Yep. Okay, cool. So Reformed Egyptian versus Udo Aztecan. Which one do you think wins? While I'm tallying what the chat says, let's talk about the last one: Chiasmus versus Hebraisms. Josh, go. So there's about. 30, I don't know, 37 different forms of Hebraisms across the, the Book of Mormon text. And so they're beautiful. They're poetic. They give, uh, when you study it out, they, they demonstrate that this was from a language that's not English. And they show an ancient text for the Book of Mormon. But not only that, there's 
beauty within the text, and then chiasmus, the inverted parallelism that's within the Book of Mormon, and the hundreds of incredible examples that are in the Book of Mormon that it stands alone on its own. So the question is, and the challenge is, is the inverted parallelisms across the Book of Mormon cumulatively stronger than all the other Hebraisms combined? And that's the vote that we're making today. Okay, repeat that last sentence really fast. That was very, <laughs> very, very big-brained. Okay, you said... Uh, are all right, the... so if we did not have chiasmus in the Book of Mormon, but we only had the 37 other or whatever, the 30 other different forms of Hebraisms within the Book of Mormon, would that be stronger than if we just had chiasmus alone? Because I think chiasmus is pretty darn strong. Oh, I see what you're saying. That's, so, the, like, that's the Hebraisms versus chiasmus, because they're under the same umbrella. Yeah, okay. And so it's kind of like, if I understand you correctly, Starbucks coffee does not actually have a direct competitor in the United States of America. All these it's coffee analogies this last week. Yeah, for I real. like it. I yeah, tell you, we're, yeah. getting, we're getting a new convert <laughs> over here to the Church of Jesus Christ, because we serve coffee Sunday mornings. If you yeah, love yeah. coffee and the Book of Mormon, come to the Church of Jesus Christ. That's funny. So the uh, um, Starbucks coffee has no direct competitor. Their direct competitor is the amalgamation of all the other small coffee exactly. shops. Exactly. Yep. And so you're saying the Starbucks coffee of Hebraisms is actually the fact that there are documentable and provable chiasmus um, poems, I guess yeah. they would be called in the Book of Mormon. Um, and that is just such a big daddy proof that all the other Hebraisms like Sariah and Ulick and so on and so forth, they just don't compare with chiasmus is what you're saying. Something like that. So that's, hey, we got to do head to head with something in the top 16. So yeah, that's what I came up with. Okay. So. Well, the audience has chosen Udo Aztecan winning Ooh, over reformed Egyptian. I agree. So the audience has chosen. Yeah. You agree? Looks like Brad agrees as well. So Udo Aztecan has advanced, and it looks like I, I'm going to put this one out to the audience as well. What do you think is a stronger evidence? Do you think chiasmus or Hebraisms is? And then also put in the chat as well. Um, actually, first put in the chat, do you think chiasmus beats Hebraisms? Okay. And what do you guys think? Do you think chi I say just go with chiasmus because it's fun drawing those graphs and it's kind of cool? Plus, uh, in alphabetical order, I'm down with just the C before the H. Also, I don't know what all the other Hebraisms are, so out of simply availability bias, I, uh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? There, there are some really cool ones. There are some fascinating yeah. ones. But, dude, chiasmus mixed with the way that the Book of Mormon was written, right? Like, you do not, on the fly off the cuff dictate to your friend across the table from you alma 36 which the entire chapter my favorite chapter. is a complete yeah it's an amazing chapter and it's a complete chiasmus from start to finish okay well joseph smith was just a con man and that was a lucky <laughs> guess all 32 verses backwards and forwards were just a lucky guess so uh tapers tapers <laughs> And uh, I'm going to read a super chat now. Do you like that debunking? It was pretty much right on par with what we deal with most of the time. So anyway, Hot Sauce says, has anyone heard this? Uh, has her Sorry, has anyone heard that the sword of Laban was passed down to eventually uh, Nephi via Laban and was the fiery flaming sword from the Garden of Eden? Maybe was at least patterned after the original? Question mark. How uh, would one fashion one? Well, Jerry Grover, how would one fashion his own sword of Laban? And could it have been fashioned after the sword in the garden of eden bro hashtag michigan artifacts are real uh, i'm i'm not quite sure what the what the what metals were available in the garden of eden honestly so okay but well i think don bradley is kind of indicating don don, don, don bradley's your guy yeah he's basically said it, it looks like it actually was the sword owned by joseph that joseph had so at least it goes back to egypt right whether it goes yeah. further back it looks to be it had a gold hilt it was described by Joseph Smith Sr. as being kind of rusted away, um, yeah, which actually makes sense, especially when you look at the Jaredite, the the people of of Limhi, when they went and found the Jaredite, they thought they had found the sacred relics of Zarahemla, and they had the cankered swords. So it actually would make sense that maybe it was already rusted by that point in time. So it's it's an it's just like Nephi described as a, some sort of fine iron. Okay. 
So maybe I, maybe Damascus steel or something like I've that. I've got one better for hot sauce. Hot sauce, not only is it the sword from the Garden of Eden, but it was the sword carried by, what's the book of Revelation say? In the war of heaven. The general of the good side in the war of heaven had it, gave it to the angel that had the cherubim and the flaming sword, who then gave it to Joseph, who then gave it to Aaron, who then gave it to freaking Laban, who then got it to Nephi. And you want to know what? The church still has it in that rock. No, no, it's somewhere. buried in the vault in Monongahela. <laughs> okay. The bicker tonight's got it, and they won't share. No. Nope. So we need to storm the castle and take or, it back. And so Monongahela is for sale. Okay, this is. Money. Yeah, I was going to say, do you guys need to pay off some of your paid clergy, bro? And yeah. maybe. No paid clergy, no <laughs> debt. Okay. Yeah, no paid clergy, no debt. That's funny. That's absolutely hilarious. Um, uh, okay, so hot sauce. Uh, how could one fashion one? Well, I, we would assume that it would have been fashioned similar to other sorts at that time. Uh, this uh, it's it's overlooked, I believe, while reading Don Bradley's book, The Lost 116 Pages. He talks about the little known um, verses where Joseph of Egypt says that he wants his bones taken back to Israel. So he actually has like his own kind of coffin or sarcophagi. I don't know what you're going to call it. Uh, uh, that the uh, the ancient Israelites traveled with as well. And if he had a vision seeing the beginning and the end of his people, he would most likely have seen the conquest of Canaan and probably fashioned some kind of relic sword for those that were going to be involved in that conquest. So the sword of Joshua very easily could have been the sword of Laban. And um, and if that's the case, then it would be like a freaking cool looking Kopesh. Oh, what's a Kopesh? Ooh, that sounds like a Pull very it nice. It sounds like a hot cup of coffee. Uh, K -H -O -P -E -S -H. Like an espresso. Like and then Jonah has sent us an updated bracket in the Discord as well. Okay, so Kopesh. Oh, Jonah Barnes. Oh, that would be cool. So here I am pulling. Oh, and Amazon.com. You can buy a 27 inch Egyptian Kopesh. I what? am opening this link. And dude, look at this on Amazon.com right now. Uh, for $199. Worth every penny. You can buy. Look at this, bro. You literally can buy for $199 by U.S. traders a 27-inch Egyptian Kopesh sword. Now that would cut yeah. off the head of a horse with one swing. <laughs> that, that is. Now, that's Could you imagine a dude, like, a warrior riding it on a taper with a Kopesh? That would be freaking sick. Fidget the crazy, you draw that one, and that's going to be a freaking thumbnail somewhere, man. <laughs> Now, one of the one of the problems with this is Kopesh were made with bronze. You wouldn't really be able to make that style of a blade with steel. So this kind of goes against what Nephi says when he said it was made with the finest steel. However, we also have in the Bible times where they refer to stuff as steel that would have probably just been bronze anyway. And it, it may just be a loan shift for the word. Okay, cool. And then the uh, uh, the last one here was, oh yeah, Jonah Barnes. Uh, this is an amazing stream. Thank you very much for the super chat. Josh is my favorite faith cousin. Updated bracket in the Discord. So we are going to the Discord right now. As I pull up from the host Discord, which is different than the community Discord, I will put in a plug for the community Discord. If you guys want, go to wardradio.com in the top Ooh, right social cool. bar. Uh, a social media bar, you will actually see an invite to the Ward Radio Discord. It's a super fun social media app in which you can ch it's everything cool about Reddit mixed with everything cool about Facebook with everything cool about uh, I don't know, Snapchat and all of the above. Um, full of all kinds of cool, fun, faithful people. We don't gatekeep. You don't have to temp uh, be have a temple recommend or have to be even a member of our church to participate there. You just got to be cool. No I thought spamming. Jonah's updated bracket was going to actually be all the different branches of the restoration and just picking out his favorite out of the group. So. Oh, that, that's funny. No, here's the updated bracket. Updated bracket. Nehom wins. Mulek wins. Nehom meets, uh, beats Mulek. And Nehom beats Manuscripts. Now we've got Chiasmus beating out... Uh, no, sorry. Udo Aztecan beating out Reformed Egyptian. Chiasmus beating out Hebraisms. And uh, we got a vote really fast. Chiasmus v. Udo Aztecan. Uh, what do you guys think? Chiasmus versus Udo Aztecan. Who wins that one so we can complete the bracket? You guys going to ask her? The yeah, no, oh. let's ask all the hosts right now. Oh, okay. Brad, Udo Aztecan versus Chiasmus. What do you choose, my man? Oh, you're still muted. No. <laughs> it's all good. 
the, sorry, the baby was coughing. I think I'm going to have to go with Utah as Tekken on that one because it's it's a huge one. And I, I don't know why people are sleeping on this. It is amazing research and work that Brian Stubbs has done. And it's out there. Like, there's no way that you could have made this up, right? Yeah. This is people's language for like hundreds of years. And it's yeah. all there. It's so cool. To certifiably demonstrate that there were two migrations through language families that show a 30% uh, impact into the area that the Book of Mormon predicts at the right time period. Udo has taken is probably the greatest, dis, you know, unveiling of a discovery this century. And so it hands down is underrated. And it, it to me, while chiasmus should be in everybody's final four, it, it's, it's losing this direct head to head for me. Yeah, I was going to say, if everything you say about it is true, it's boom shakalaka, one of the most overwhelming evidences of the Book of Mormon. But, let me, but let, tapers! Let me put but a, tapers! <laughs> let me put a plug in. Um, it's actually, I published that book, the bit larger book for Brian. Yep. It's on my website, www.bmslr.org. Now you're just bragging. And it, well, so it's free. Pride it, cometh before the fall. Well, it's free, yeah. so I'm not that proud. <laughs> Tapers! <laughs> <laughs> but but there's also another book that Brian does sell. I yes. actually have a link to it on Amazon that is for the layperson. It's a cliff note version. Yeah, the, the layperson he has written. A small book, not, not very expensive. Yeah. So I recommend people, they can look at the linguistic book. It's actually kind of complex, but he has a smaller book that you might want to purchase that, uh, that um, yeah. Changes in languages from like Nephi until now, yep. I think, is the cool. title by Brian Rock Stubbs. On. Brian on. Yep. So I've, we're gonna do it. I'm voting yep. for that. You okay. So Udo Aztec and beats out Chiasmus. Uh, destruction versus Tumbaga. I'd say. Uh, what do you say, Brad? Destruction versus Tumbaga. Ah, mm, man, I like Tumbaga. Tumbaga. Yeah, I, I like go it. with Tumbaga. Like what Tumbaga. do you say, Josh? And I blow it up with the destruction. You blow it up with the destruction. What do you say, Jerry? You're a geologist. You're going to be a destruction stand. I, yeah, I've got to do the destruction. Okay, Ed, okay. Ed, <laughs> Ed, tiebreaker, Ed. Tumbaga, because I believe we can make it and prove its existence. Okay, Tumbaga, believe because you believe we can make it and prove its existence. We can make a volcano blow up. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen that YouTube video? What of city people? are we bringing down? Yeah, dude, Mexico City is screwed when that when that volcano <laughs> blows up, dude. No, Guatemala City. Oh yeah, that's is. true. Have you seen the video of those like teenagers that pushed the giant rock into the volcano and like caused an eruption? I'm pretty sure that's like every cartoon movie for the end of the world. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. I'll have to look that up. It's pretty funny. Okay, and then so if Kayaz if Udo Aztecan beats out Kayazmis, and then Tumbaga beats out destruction it looks like tumbaga is up against udo aztecan what do you think wins between tumbaga and udo aztecan my friends what do you think wins josh uh, okay you utah aztecan wins every time okay so here here's here's the thing for me tumbaga is awesome but we don't necessarily have really solid evidence of it in the right area of mesoamerica at the right time there's some of it, it, it's more Colombian. So you're a and Heartlander. So, you're a Heartlander. Yeah, you're a Colombia is filthy Heartlander. heartlander. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, so because of that, like weakness, that little, that tiny weakness in the Tumbaga, I think I'm going to go with the Utah Aztecan as well. Oh, I see. Jerry, uh, yeah. I'm going with uh, Tubo Aztecan. Tubo Aztecan. Tubo Aztecan. <laughs> Tubo Aztecan. That's funny. You're so diplomatic. You're so diplomatic. I, I, never decide, I just don't want to offend anyone. I'm such a nice guy. I hear you. Okay. Even and, though I wrote both books. So. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, uh, I'm going with... Let's go your favorite you're, you're Aztecan. You're Aztecan's good. I'm going with the Udo Aztecan as well. So right now, the final bracket oh. is between Nahom and Udo Aztecan yeah. as the two strongest arguments... For the Book of Mormon. That's a great finals, by the way. That's okay. a great we, finals. We have an updated bracket, so pull that up. Okay, so Out here the was Discord. the original bracket. I've got the original bracket right here, okay? And then now we've got an updated bracket brought to you by none other than the Associate Professor of All Things Apocryphal. It looks <sighs> like Nehom versus Udo Aztecan. What wins in this one? I know my choice. I know my choice. What's yours? Audience, what do you think wins in the showdown, the March Madness showdown of Book of Mormon evidences, the Sweet 16 top evidences for the Book of Mormon? 
which one wins between Nahom and Udo Aztecan, all right? Um, I want to see what you guys think in the uh, comments below. Uh, before we speak in the comments, I do want to read one that's really, really funny here. Canudo de Leon, who's uh, been a member for quite some time now. I believe he was gifted a membership, if I'm not mistaken. So um, if you guys are feeling generous, you can always gift a membership to somebody else in the chat. And also don't forget to renew your membership to this chat, um, not to this chat, to this channel, if you guys want early access to our videos, such as the Evidences of the Book of Mormon, which we are going to be recording tomorrow. That'll be super fun. We're going to have some of those, and you guys will get early access. Also, sometimes you get early access to the morning shows as well. So anyway, um, his uh, username is Canuto de Leon, and he said, Canuto Aztecan. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah. Yeah, pretty I like that. sick. That's, I like that. I'm digging it. I'm digging that's it. That's the Canadian version of <laughs> Utah Aztecan. Yeah, that's pretty funny. Okay, so anyway, and I'm letting Uto. the chat choose what wins between Nahom and Udo Aztecan. We've got one for Nahom, two for Nahom, one for Udo Aztecan, two for Udo Aztecan, three for Udo Aztecan. Oh, no. Nahom and Nahom. Okay, so the first seven. It looks like four to three. Yeah, five uh, to three. Yeah, f five to three. Wait. Okay. Okay, yeah. we need to read this one from Sheba Inferno. Okay. No other success can compensate for failure at Nehom. <laughs> <laughs> that is it's so David Omukere. That was so awesome. Okay, well, so it was another one for Nehom, awesome, another one for Nehom. Okay, so it looks like it's about 10 to four in the chat, guys. No, um, no, we, we have certifiable evidence through this research for cross-continental, you know, migration. These are two slam dunk wins, but man, listen. There's I, no the, Indiana Jones and the search for the 30% verified uh, uh, fractional linguistic Listen, shifts. I'm retiring and I'm hanging my fedora on <laughs> Uto Ashtaken. <laughs> and, and Cardin, I've got to say, I think the only reason people aren't all about Uto Aztecan is because this has not been dived into enough. And it's super complicated. It's super complicated and deep. You need to understand linguistics and the comparative method. And you need to understand movies. Nothing is archaeologically real until Indiana Jones finds it. And then it really actually happened. And <clears throat> Indiana Jones is not finding, you keep mispronouncing it, the Uto Aztecan. Okay? And wow. he ain't going to find that in those, those catacombs underneath the freaking where the pope lives okay well one of the so one of the <laughs> one of the words was flint knife which was used to cut the hearts out of people by the aztecs so hey, okay so you know it has some something cool right oh yeah it's kind of indiana, cool. indiana jones yeah. temple of doom indiana jones and <laughs> the temple, pyramid. temple of doom temple of doom where he's cutting out his yeah take that <laughs> louche <laughs> rock yeah. and also cardin cardin let me win you over to the utah aztec inside here okay you have Exmos out there who think they have answers to the home. What? Now I don't think they're correct. I don't think they're correct. None of them know what to do with Utah Aztec. Yeah, it's such a slam dunk. It's it's. These are the so same people. Tight. These are the same people. Okay, these are the same people that wanted cops to arrest people for jogging on the beach without a mask in Huntington Beach. So if they say they got an answer to a respiratory illness that has a 99.9% .9 survival rate, if arrest is their answer, all right, then these people don't have an answer, okay, to, to Nahom, all right? What are they saying? What are they saying? What, what, what's their answer to Nahom? Tapers! Tapers! There were no tapers in Saudi Arabia! <laughs> That's what probably what no, saying. no, no. <clears throat> I, I don't think it's important to get into it here. I'm just saying, if you want something that will you, when you tell them and they look this up, you will see the gears in their head just explode if they try to actually engage with this one garden. Like they, they don't know what to do with it because because Utah has taken is is honestly it's the it's the response to DNA. Because when you're looking at, at genetic impact coming into the new world, there's things like genetic drift and stuff that eliminate it from even being a, a testable hypothesis. So reasonably, based on the data of population genetics, you probably, based on the Book of Mormon story, could not track those migrations through DNA. But language is the answer. And when it was actually studied by the only 
professional on planet Earth that had the, the method down and the knowledge of the language families down enough to do the study, it answered questions that were unknown within its own community based on the migrations that is predicted within the Book of Mormon. It's amazing. Rock on. Cool. All right. Well, we got to do something on, how do you pronounce it again? Uh, however Brian Stubbs wants to pronounce it. Utah Aztecan. Whatever you said there. And Aztecan, it's Nahuatl anyway, so it's not even the right language. So. Who's waddling where? What? Nahuatl's one of the... Nahuatl is the language family for... Is one of them. One of them, yeah. Nahuatl's one of the languages in the U.S. Aztecan language family. Yeah. Oh, okay. I yeah. thought you said waddle. Which was spoken by the Aztecs. Yeah. So... Okay, I mean... And, and still is spoken. Okay, in, I'm an idiot. Mexico. You guys aren't idiots. You guys are the smart ones. You're the big-brained ones in the room. All right, cool. So, Brad, any last words here? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm still with Nahuatl. Because to me, it seems more like an Indiana Jones film. And yeah. <laughs> Steven Spielberg formatted my millennial brain in the late 80s and early 90s. And so that's my story, and I'm sticking with it. However, all of you boring people can go with Udo <laughs> Aztecan. And that's fine, though, because you guys write books and are respected in academic circles, uh, while I well. am not. You know what I'm saying? And Brad himself is an author. Before we go, Brad, there's been a couple of comments in the chat of people that have said they've bought your book, started reading it with your family, and are enjoying it. In fact, Descartes said that um, he or she, I can't remember, uh, has purchased your book. And so, awesome. Also, Bambi1830, I think we got a bicker tonight in the chat because she's been pumping up uh, Josh Gailey and a couple of the other um uh, cool uh, evidences he's brought for it here. So it looks like we got a a, a fellow. Uh, you have to plan a couple people in the audience. No, That's it's just... great. It's great. We've got a confederate. She is in on it with you. Oh, pumping Bambi, you up. Bambi's denying it. Bambi's saying not a bicker tonight. Ba- not a bicker tonight. There oh, we go. well, there I just we didn't go. recognize her from previous chats. So just Bambi. went to a service and loved it. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah. so Bambi 1830, welcome. You're not a member though, so that's the last one you get. Um, no, I'll be in the, I'll be in the <laughs> Bell Branch in California on Sunday if anybody wants to come. Yeah, I wouldn't wish that uh, knowledge upon any of the ex-Mormon, anti-Mormons that watch our show regularly. But <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm like, there we go. You know, who well, knows? Ed's coming. He's the bodyguard. It's yeah, okay. that's true. Okay. I was going to say, I'm going to okay. pay Ed an extra yeah. day. So, so we need the final word. Did oh. Utah Aztec and win? What's your so you say Udo Aztecan? Well, did the group? I think the group voted. The group, the group, yeah, the, yeah. The, the audience voted Nahom. So okay, so audience by audience vote, it's Nahom. Yep. By our group, Uto Aztecan. Yeah. Okay. All right. Which yeah. I guess means the 2024 champ. They're both so good. Yeah. The, the, so the Critics Choice Award goes to Udo Aztecan. But the People's Choice Award goes to Nahum. That's right. Is what you're saying, That's right? That's right. Okay, I'm fine with the bracket ending this way. Looks like the final bracket, ladies and gentlemen, as shown here, is that Nahum is the uh, the People's Choice. Udo Aztecan is the Critics' Choice Award for the Book of Mormon Evidence Suite 16. Now, before we go, guys, please make sure that you like the stream. Looks like we still got a ton of people in this chat. I'm actually going to play a fun, cool little outro song so you guys can keep chatting. But speaking of chatting, um, make sure, please, that you go to the Discord. Let's keep the conversation flowing. Let's keep the conversation going. We have a very high, actually, chat per minute rate on our live streams. It's one of the more fun parts about being in the Ward Radio Rigwam. Also, if you're watching this stream after the stream has gone live, um, please consider helping us out. Uh, if you can't super chat during the live stream, which helps keep the lights on here and so on and so forth, please make sure that you consider a contribution, a contribution through the cash app. We're at Ward Radio on the cash app. We're also at Ward Radio on uh, Venmo. That's a really cool way that you can contribute to our program. And everybody pull up a copy of your books, Brad. Josh, Jerry, if you guys got books you want to promo really fast, check out all of this literature here. Josh, you go first. Witnessing Miracles, Historical Evidence for the Resurrection, and Book of Mormon by Josh Gailey. All of the funds go towards what, Josh? All the funds go towards translating and printing uh, foreign languages of the Book of Mormon worldwide. Okay. And the translation's not so bad. You know what I'm saying? It's pretty solid. That first rough draft we were talking about earlier. Jerry, do you need a copy of your book? Uh, I'm, almost, I'm almost out. I need to buy that back. You need to buy that back, yeah. Here's a copy of your book, bro. Put it up. Put it up. So yeah. we got it, you know? Okay. Yeah, this is the last book, Calendars and Chronology of the Book of Mormon. Um, it's uh, 
it's available on my website for free to download in PDF format if you want a hard copy. Yeah, and on, if you want to on, take up 300 gigabytes on your computer because it's 600 pages long. Well, but, you, you can actually <laughs> read it there, too. You don't have to download yeah. it. So um, anyway, it is on eBay, I think. So Okay. Rock on. Awesome. And you also got a bunch of other really cool literature that I have right here, and we're going to have to publicize in future episodes. And Brad, Brad, hit us, my man. What's your book? You got a okay. second uh, or a third book coming out here pretty soon, right? Yeah, pretty soon here. Now, first off, Jonah says that the final trophy – the podium is in the discord. So pull that up while I'm doing this. Okay. Uh, our first book, dragon thief, super awesome book. Just, uh, this is what a real fantasy book written by an LDS person would look like. Great. Beach Not the book. book of Mormon. Great beach. Now, book. <laughs> what was that? I read it on the beach. It's a great beach book. Cool. <laughs> Rock on. And check this out. This is the hardcover. Uh, now my wife designed this Riley. She designed the cover and we have an interior cover under the jacket. So it looks all classy and awesome. Oh, that's pretty rad. We got a really fun thing going on there. Now, the cool thing about our book, actually, since I'm bringing it up right now, I mean, this won't matter for anyone after the live stream, but our ebook for this book is only a buck right now. And then the, um, the actual, the sequel is available for free right now, too, on Amazon. So if anyone goes to skystonechronicles.com, they can get that. Um, and I mean, I'm not doing anything cool with the funds of this, but every dollar I make goes to feeding my children. So there's that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a noble cause. Keep having them, bro. We need the baby fund. We need the baby fund. And, uh, also looks like we've got the final bracket here by Jonah Barnes. Thank you very much. Jonah Barnes, associate professor of all things apocryphal says, Nahum is in first place. Udo Aztecan. Popping the champagne bottle in second place. And third place is the manuscripts with Joseph Smith. Chad Joseph Smith with the goggles on, glasses on, saying hashtag deal with it. Like an absolute yeah. boss. So anyway, um, guys, this has been totally awesome. It has been absolutely real and it has been fun. I don't have a cool book to show off. This channel, I guess, is my book. But me and Jonah Barnes are working on a Ward Radio, um, not compendium, shall we say, but just like Hugh Nibley had his compiled works. We're actually going through the Apocrypha and he's uh, been writing a really, really cool um, commentary on the Apocrypha and uh, some of the cool cosmology of Joseph Smith that shows up in some of the Apocryphal works and the Dead Sea Scrolls, so on and so forth. I'm sure it's a book that Josh will love to it, hold it high. Like it sounds hold high as a representation of the most elevated academic standards of, <laughs> of Listen, it'll, radio be, it'll be in the Sweet 16 next year where it falls. I have no idea. <laughs> where it falls, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? But actually, there's some really cool stuff in the Dead Sea Scrolls that it's fun food for thought, and it's some of the stuff that we absolutely cherish and love talking um, about uh, on this channel. And we're going to write some cool books about it and uh, give out some super cool um, public domain translations of some of these actually surprisingly harder to find and get a hold of um, translations. Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls, though, everybody knows what they are. They're actually surprisingly hard. They're not the most accessible literature out there. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of crazy. What are your thoughts on those? We'll have to get into that in another episode, Josh. You got yeah. something to say really fast? What? No, they, all the Dead Sea Scrolls are pretty much published on a on a online thing that you can check out now. Which well, I know they got the Nog Hammadi Library. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty well published because um, they got their own website for it in multiple languages and you can see the original Greek. But also when people say Dead Sea Scrolls, we really kind of are colloquially, at least, referring to a lot of the more modern manuscripts that have been discovered. And like, for example, would you say this new scroll found in Pompeii, Pompeii that was carbonized that they're finally able to scan and read the Greek of um, that colloquially that would be called a Dead Sea Scroll right because no. it's kind of one of the more modern yeah we kind of say that to no. anything that's modern discovered after the 40s man no you know I know it's technically the Nag <laughs> that's Qumran and the Nag Hammadi library but kind of we kind of it's kind of like Kleenex Kleenex isn't just the brand of Kleenex we kind of consider anything that's a modern manuscript finding people call them Dead Sea Scrolls now right no. <laughs> no. You don't think that's a thing? <laughs> I've heard that's not a thing. <laughs> there's been out there's been uh, <laughs> scrolls found outside of the dead uh, outside of specifically the Nag Hammadi library and the discoveries of Qumran that have been called Dead Sea Scrolls and like documentaries I've seen and stuff like that. 
Dude, those documentaries, I, I don't know what you're watching, but uh, Mostly I, I History don't recommend Channel them. and Gaia. Well, there you go. No, I'm just kidding, dude. I'm just totally <laughs> kidding, bro. <laughs> so anyway, um, okay, cool. It's all so, ancient aliens. <laughs> yeah, dude, one. for real. So, um, okay, awesome. Well, guys, it has been absolutely real and has been fun. And it's been real fun. Um, as always, for this and more, please make sure that you check us out at wardradio.com. I built a rocket in my basement. I'm going to fly it to the moon. This supersonic is amazing. You're going to feel my sonic boom. I'm flying higher and I'm never coming down. Look at me now. Look at me now. Into this function, yeah. we show up dressing to the nines. Okay, now I've never need an introduction. No matter what, we're feeling fine. I'm flying high and I'm never coming down. Look at me now. Look at me now. Look, look at me now. Look at me now. I can't stop. I'm never giving up because I'm way too hot.